Yeah. Okay, we're now live streaming. Um, I've just had a request from a member. As the screen behind me is not working, can we have it and the, the projector turned off, please? Because it's it's quite bright. Oh. Okay, we're now live streaming. Um, I've just had I think a request I just from a member. As the screen behind me is not working, can we have it and the, the projector turned off, please? Because it's it's quite bright. Finally, good morning, everybody, properly, and good morning to those uh, members uh, of the public watching virtually. Welcome to this meeting of the Eastern Area Planning Committee. And uh, this is one of three area based committees of Dorset Council. And our remit covers the previous Purbeck District Council and most of the previous East Dorset District Council areas. For the benefit of the public, I'm Councillor Tony Coombs and I'm chairing this meeting today. I also would like to introduce to you the officer team supporting us today. We have Mike Garrity, Head of Planning. Bill Crowther is our legal support. And then our planning officers are Ms Adams, Lucy Page, Hugh Williams. Uh, then we have also Steve Savage from Highways and Andrew Douglas, who is the tree officer, and Sarah Barber, senior landscape officer. And last but not least, we have David Northover, who is our committee support officer today. So as you're obviously aware in the room, this meeting is being live streamed and a copy of the meeting will be available on the website afterwards. And by attending this meeting, you do consent to being filmed. Although, as you'll probably be aware, the camera is on the small table at the front of the room facing this way. So members of the public, you are probably shielded from having your moment of fame online. <clears throat> uh, I would also like to thank the officers behind the scenes who are making this possible and thanking them for all their endeavours in trying to get everything set up this morning. I am pleased to welcome the members of the public to listen to our debate and to the decisions being taken this morning. And that those of you that have um, asked in accordance with our procedures will be able to directly address us during the meeting as the relevant application comes before us. And the procedures on public participation you will find under agenda item four. I am going to take the agenda as printed. Um, so, apologies for absence, David, please. Yes, Chairman. Apologies received from Councillor Trout, um, Councillor Cook, and John Worth emailed in Worth overnight. So, everyone else, I believe, is here. So, thank you, members. Can I ask if from members, are there any declarations of pecuniary or other conflict of interest, bias or predetermination? If nothing comes to mind now, if it does become apparent during the meeting, please let me know as soon as you become aware of that and we'll record it. Item three is to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 20th of July. Are members happy that they are a true record of our meeting, if you can remember that far back? And they're on pages five to 18 of the agenda. Chairman. Chairman. All in assent? Thank you, members. OK, so regarding public participation, can I remind members of the public that this is a meeting held in public and not a public meeting? The first three members of the public, including any community or amenity group who have registered to speak for and against the application, including the applicant or their representative, so that's a maximum of six in total, will be invited to address the committee directly. If the applicant or their representative registers to speak, then only the first two members of the public who wish to speak for the application may address the committee. Uh, as a note for your information, MPs will also need to register in the same way and will count as one of the six speakers. We have no members of Parliament wishing to speak today. I think they're otherwise occupied. <laughs> Town and Parish Councils and Ward members of Dorset Council who are not members of the committee and who wish to address us will be allowed to speak providing they have given the due notice. 
and all requests to speak have to have been registered by Democratic Services by 8.30 a.m. on Monday the 5th of September. And each speaker will be strictly limited to three minutes. So that is the general housekeeping out of the way. And we move on to the schedule of planning applications and we have four in front of us today. Have there been any requests for deferrals or withdrawals, please? No chair, thank you. So the background information relating to applications before us has been available for inspection by members prior to the meeting, and that covers consultations, objections, representations, as well as the East Dorset and Purbeck local plans and the council's related policies. I have already sort of had to shout out a few times, but please, as you move around the room, be aware of the trip hazards from the cables that are variously strewn around the room. I will invite the case officer to introduce their item. Members of the public, planning agents, applicants, and town and parish councils who have registered to speak will be allowed to address the committee following, in the following order. Public against the application, public in support of the application, the applicant or agent, the town or parish council, and then the local member. Following the public's participation section on every item, I will ask officers if there are any salient points that they wish to respond to. And at the end of that time, if you haven't said what you wish to say as a member of the public, you have missed the boat. I will not allow any interruption once we move into the member discussion and member debate. So once the officers have clarified any points that are brought up, I will then open up the debate to members for questions and the debate. And in order to run the meeting, may I request that members of the committee direct any remarks or questions through myself as the chair, and I will invite members to speak in turn. Can you please ensure that your microphones are on mute and your device volume is set to zero to maintain audio quality so we don't get any feedback? At the end of the debate, I will take the vote by a show of hands, and the voting detail will be recorded in the minutes if three or four members make the necessary request for a recorded vote. So our first application is agenda item six, PFUL 2022-03143. Change of use from agricultural to eight self-storage units at Walston Poultry Farm. And those units are for B8 storage only and that's in Gaunt's Common. Uh, for those of you that have the agenda, that's pages 23 to 44. Liz, you're going to take us through the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. Uh, this application comes before you this morning uh, as the officer's recommendation for approval is on balance. Um, objections have been received from the Parish Council, from Councillor Cook as ward member, and from a large number of local residents. A similar application for unfettered B8 storage use was refused last year on the grounds that the scale of development would be inconsistent with settlement and transport policies and because trip rates could not be controlled, it was there was concern that a large number of trips associated with multiple storage units would be likely to harm both the rural character of the area and neighbouring amenity. This application seeks to overcome those concerns and the previous reasons for refusal by limiting the proposed use to B8 um, self-storage units, just eight in total within the existing buildings. So the site is adjacent to Gaunt's Common, a linear development northeast of Wimborne, uh, which you can see here, hopefully, on the plan uh, on your laptops. Um, so the application site is located immediately, oh, there we go, immediately adjacent to, but outside of the infill envelope, which you can see in yellow here. And the purple land to the east is ancient woodland and a designated triple SI. And the whole area is, is designated as green belt. The site is approximately 0.1 hectares in size, and it is accessed from the main road through Gaunt's Common. There are four poultry sheds, which hopefully you can see there, um, on the site with hard standing between them and an area of hard standing identified for turning to the north. It's understood that the sheds are and have been used for intensive poultry farming. Uh, the layout of the site does not facilitate their use for free range farming. 
There were two dwellings within the parcel of land owned by the applicant. The old oak lies to the north of the access and the bungalow is accessed through the site. And this property is understood to accommodate a farm worker. So the poultry barns are squat, <coughs> gable end buildings set into the hillside. Uh, they have a door at one end and a se separate door in the centre, which isn't shown on this elevation plan as we didn't need the detail because no external changes to the building are proposed. Um, it's proposed that the change um, of this, the site would change from agricultural to storage. Specifically, eight units would be available for rent as self-storage. It's anticipated that each unit would be divided internally into two to provide the units, but as this work would not require planning permission, the layout could be amended in the future, although the number of units could not exceed eight, and that's subject to a condition that is proposed on your agenda. Uh, so these are some photos here. So this is the view on entering the site. You see uh, units, what would be units one and four here, uh, contained within two poultry units on the southern part of the site, sunk into the hillside here. And then existing hard sanding, okay, move on to the next one between the, the units is, is seen here. And you can see, um, hopefully there's a slightly higher part of the roof, which is where the central door um, exists. And that would allow entry into the one or both units. Uh, these are the northern units adjacent to the triple SI woodland, which you can see in the background. Do apologise to the members of the public, you have to use their imagination. Um, the buildings, uh, floor level of building E is lower than building D, so that slide just shows uh, the difference in about a metre. Those are the ones to the north of the site. So the main objections to the proposal are that the location lacks the necessary highway infrastructure to serve the proposed storage use and that an increase in traffic associated with the use will result in harm to the character of the area, to neighbouring amenity and danger for road users. And then there's other concerns as well, all listed in the report, which include harm to biodiversity from air and water pollution, harm to Little Thatch, which is a listed building, um, which we'll come to in a minute, harm to the Greenbelt. Um, and so the officer's report assesses each of these concerns and explains why, following the refusal of the previous application for unspecified B8 storage, officers have decided to recommend approval for the current more specific scheme. I'm obviously happy to respond to questions that you have, but the next few slides provide some additional visual detail, which may hopefully assist your assessment. So, um, concerns have been raised about the sustainability of the location of the poultry farm for B8 use, which is associated with vehicular movements as customers drop off and collect items of storage, um, or in storage rather. So as explained in the title principle of development in the report on page 32, policy PC4 is positive about the reuse of existing buildings within the countryside for economic purposes, provided that the benefits outweigh the harm to the countryside. Uh, there's appropriate accessibility to markets, developments consistent in scale to its rural location and shouldn't harm amenity. So this map um, is taken from the applicant's supporting statement and it seeks to demonstrate a gap in the market for self-storage opportunities and to identify a market area anticipated for the proposed use. Officers recognise that the area identified is sparsely populated and there are other storage facilities within Woodlands, for instance, which are not shown on this plan as it only includes all advertised self-storage facilities in the area. Um, a local need for storage is reflected in some of the applications received by the local planning authority for new storage buildings um, in the locality, which are usually refused due to greenbelt policy. Um, previous application for B8 use of the building was judged to um, lack the specificity needed for officers to be confident that the use wouldn't generate traffic levels that would result in harm to the character and immunity um, of local residents in the local area. So this current application, although it's for the same size of buildings, introduces a limitation to uh, the description. Now we've only got eight self-storage units available for rent. A transport assessment accompanies this latest application, and this recognises that uh, storage use can be associated with significant trip rates. But the best available data comes from storage facilities that offer a much larger number of units. Um, 
And officers therefore recognise that with only eight units being provided, it's likely that suggested peak rates of maybe four, maybe five two-way trips per hour would be a worst case scenario. So BA use can be associated with heavy goods vehicles. It's recognised that the road running through Gaunt's Common is a C road. It doesn't have pavements and the nearest B road is Cramble Road, some 3.5 kilometres to the west. So large vehicles can be associated with a loss of rural tranquility. But as officers, the baseline use of the site is for agriculture. So it's not subject to any conditions limiting the number of or the size of um, vehicles using the site. And there is evidence that HGVs are associated with the poultry use. As the number of units and overnight parking can be controlled by condition and self storage is proposed, the likelihood of significant numbers of HGV movements has been reduced to a level where it's judged that the previous reason for refusal relating to harm to the character of the area from vehicle movements and associated noise has been appropriately addressed. Um, these are some pictures of the access so that hopefully you can understand further where we're talking about. The access to the site lies between Little Thatch, which you see here on the left, and Old Oak on the right. That's looking out towards the road. It measures approximately 3.4 metres wide. And you'll see that bollards protect the verge west of the entrance. Some more photos here looking out from the junction. Concerns have been raised by objectors about the appropriateness of the access and its ability to accommodate <coughs> vehicles. They suggest that existing agricultural HGVs have struggled to exit the site. Uh, but the council's highway team are satisfied that the existing access is fit for purpose. These photos show the route into the site from the other direction. You'll see the southern elevation of Old Oak and the northern elevation of Little Thatch. Both face the access. Officers have noted the potential for harm to the occupiers of these properties from excessive traffic movements. But with the imposition of conditions limiting open hours and restrictions on the number of units available for self storage, traffic levels and timings will be sufficiently controlled so that no demonstrable harm is anticipated. So, looking further at Little Thatch, the building is Grade 2 and listed for its vernacular and spoiled character. The proposed change of use, where storage will be confined to the existing buildings, is not judged to result in harm to the setting of this property, which is screened from the application site. Um, by the garage here and the, the um, trees, which include TPO trees. Um, as planners, we need to assume that drivers will drive with due caution and therefore concerns about potential harm to the fabric of the building from road users cannot be given weight. Any signage other than that benefiting from deemed consent would be considered under advertisement applications. And so no harm to heritage assets is anticipated from the proposal. Um, other dwellings are also positioned close to the application site who could be affected by noise for movement of storage items and also traffic through the village. And for this reason, it's been judged necessary to restrict opening hours. Uh, you'll see condition uh, eight suggests eight till six on weekdays, nine till five on Saturdays and ten till three on Sundays and bank holidays. Um, it might be tempting to want to control it further on Sundays and bank holidays, but we have to be aware of both the fallback position or the, the baseline position that agriculture activity can happen on any day of the week, and also the use for storage facilities. There may be that the customers, that might be the only day they can actually access their, their um, storage unit. Concerns have also been raised about potential pollution from items being stored. Um, this issue is covered by other legislation, and um, it would be anticipated that anybody storing their items there would benefit from insurance, which would necessitate um, requirements that um, due care and precautions are taken. The site lies outside of Gaunt's Common Village in Thalaria, which is in the Greenbelt. Uh, National Planning Policy Framework Paragraph 150 allows material changes of use of land and also changes of use of existing buildings where they don't result in additional harm to openness or um, impact on the purposes of including land within Greenbelt. As the storage would take place within the existing buildings, the existing access is already in use for residential as well as unfettered agricultural trips. Um, there's no extension to built form and parking would be between the building on areas that pre-exist and can be used for parking by agricultural vehicles at present. The development judged to accord with Greenbelt policy. 
Um, in relation to biodiversity, the current poultry use is anticipated to result in environmental benefits due to a reduction in ammonia and nitrogen emissions. In the past, ammonia from the unit has been associated with unfavourable and declining condition of the western part of the SSSI, the protected woodland closest to the site. Um, a biodiversity plan approved by the Dorset Natural Environment Team also secures some additional biodiversity enhancement through the erection of bats and bird boxes, while the grassed areas around the buildings will be anticipated to be retained. Overall, the benefits of the continued economic use of the site the reduction in ammonia and nitrogen emissions and the ability to control the use of the site by conditions is judged to outweigh the potential harm arising from additional vehicle trips on the rural highway network associated with eight self-storage units. For these reasons, Madam Chair, the officer's recommendation is approval and uh, the conditions are set out in the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. Okay, um, our first public speaker is Adam Bennett, who I believe is objecting to the proposal. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Adam Bennett. I'm a Chartered Planning Consultant from Kent Park Planning Consultants. So the application before you this morning, as you've heard, is for a change of use of existing buildings on the poultry farm to a Class B8 use. On behalf of the many residents you can see in the room here this morning who feel very, very strongly about this application, it's my professional opinion that permission should be refused. The site sits in a backland location. It's surrounded by residential properties whose curtilages adjoin the site, many with very open boundaries. It's accessed by a narrow driveway between two traditional dwelling houses, one of which, as you've heard, Little Thatch is Grade 2 listed, and the access runs right against its flank wall. The application follows a previous refusal for a Class B8 use on grounds of the sustainability of the location. It was contrary to policies KS2, PC4 and KS11 of the development plan. Also, the scale of the use proposed and harm to both character and amenity were raised as issues. We don't consider that this amended scheme addresses these issues. The application is seriously lacking in detail. The proposal seek to create eight storage units with no details of their precise size or how the buildings would be subdivided on the site, and moreover, we have no details of how these would be properly serviced. We don't know how parking or manoeuvring space would be arranged on the site, and we don't know if these are suitable to serve vehicles that would be used by the proposed operation. Class B8 storage uses are well understood, and there are very many within the district and broader conurbation. The large majority of these are located on employment sites for good reason, providing a sustainable location close to the major road network and which are capable of accommodating large vehicles, including HGV movements. This site is more than four miles from the A31 trunk road, with only low category country roads between the two. Whilst the development plan supports the reuse of buildings for employment purposes, as you've heard, at PC4, the policy requires that the proposal supports the vitality and viability of rural villages, does not have a materially greater impact upon Greenbelt or countryside, is accessible, and importantly, doesn't harm local amenity through noise or traffic, and minimises trips on the highway network, being accessible by sustainable methods, which suggests other than by private car. There are no such opportunities with this site. Officers were clear at the time of the last application the site was unsustainable and it would harm local amenity. The site and this position hasn't changed. Whilst a cursory uh, increase in detail is provided with this particular application compared with the last, we still know very little about how this could operate and what its full impacts could be, beyond there being eight large storage units of unspecified size, which clearly are not going to meet local needs. They're unlikely to meet residential needs either. If you split the units up, you're looking at units of about 3,900 square foot. That's 358 square meters. That is substantial. That is well above what a residential occupant is likely to use for storage. There will be a significant increase in vehicular movements, likely cars, vans, but also HGVs. And whilst the access has taken agricultural vehicles, you've already heard, that's not been without incident. Um, and it's not been demonstrated that the access as it exists now could take a reasonable articulated lorry for a storage use. There is no vehicular tracking. We don't have that information. Movements proposed can I alone. You know that you have used up your three minutes. So can you finish the paragraph you just started? Yeah. Then we'll call it a day. So the movements alone will be harmful this, to this particular rural community. And as a result, members, we ask you to vote to refuse the application. Thank you very much. Very much. <laughs> 
And our second speaker this morning is Brett Spiller, who is here on behalf of the applicant. And so you have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chair, councillors. The application before you is for a low impact self storage use of these largely redundant poultry sheds. You'll be familiar with the local and national planning policy on the reuse of rural buildings and rural economic development and the obvious benefits to rural life that stem from them. You will see from the committee report that this is a resubmission. The previous application was submitted in May 2021 and after several months awaiting responses to correspondence from the previous planning officer who left the council, it was unfortunately refused on only a few matters, for example, traffic concerns, despite highways having had no objection. The premises of this application has not really changed. It remains a low impact use and we have provided additional information to your officers to try and settle some of the concerns expressed by objectors, a task which your planning officers have made requests of us and have put in place controls to try and exceed. In terms of access and traffic matters, the existing poultry buildings have a credited level of traffic associated with them, including the applicant's own class one articulated HGV lorries delivering 30 tonne of poultry feed regularly to the site, and that's occurred in the past. The road safety data proves these vehicles made it in and out of the site without incident for nearly a quarter of a century. If there ever was issues of vehicles overrunning verges at the access, this was solved some years ago through the introduction of bollards on the verge opposite. Uh, and I'd also point out, as you would have seen in the photos, the mature tree uh, right on the access, which has been there for decades. In terms of amenity, light, noise, etc., the proposed use is a vast improvement on the extensive, lawful, intensive poultry use. We have worked hard with your officers to craft effective and enforceable planning controls that should give local people the comfort they need. In terms of greenbelt and landscape, there are no external changes and it's possible to accommodate any of the parking areas within the existing hard standing between the buildings. In terms of biodiversity, you've heard the, the, the benefits already relayed by your officers. The proposal has been refined to deal with local concerns and will provide for only eight self-storage units, the sort of low-cost lock-up type units that are rarely visited and provide a sensible low-impact use for redundant rural buildings. Based on the extensive work we've done with your officers leading to the recommendation of approval, we respectfully request that the application is approved with the controls that this committee sees fit to apply. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, are there any points that you wish to pick up from what you've heard from the members of the public? If I could ask Steve Savage to speak about the access. Yep. Um, yeah. Thank you, Thank Steve. You, Good morning, members. Good morning, members of the public. The, um, the existing use of the site, as you've heard, is agricultural and currently unfettered in terms of its use. Agricultural uses obviously attract large vehicles, large slow moving vehicles on the network. And historically, the site access has been utilised by large HGVs, as Mr Spiller has explained to us, obviously taking the um, poultry in and out of the site. The High Authority's opinion is that the proposed use will generate less traffic than the existing agricultural use. And this has been backed up by the transport statement that's been provided by the applicant, worst case scenarios in more urban locations, if you like, in industrial states, but it has been looked at as a worst case. We're of the opinion that traffic movement has been changed in type from large, slow moving vehicles to more predominantly light vans and cars, more appropriate to the rural network at Gaunt's Common. The access itself has been utilised by large, slow moving vehicles. Bollards were erected on the opposite side of the access to try and prevent junction overrun. But the fact that the proposal would be likely to reduce these types of vehicles using the access is a plus in highway safety terms, as far as we're concerned. As far as we're concerned in terms of the MPPF and the definition of the word severe, which is what we've got to look at as our target if we're looking to recommend refusal for applications, we don't see that this application ticks any of the necessary boxes. We don't deem it to be unsafe. We don't deem it to have an impact or adverse impact on the capacity of the network or the free flow of traffic on it. As a consequence, Chair, we are supportive of the application. Thank you. OK, my first member to speak is Shane Bartlett, followed by David Took. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, just point of clarification. Um, while, while obviously um, it's dealt with by the environment and health, hazardous and toxic materials, um, should there not be some reference to this in the conditions, such as no storage of fertilizers? I appreciate the fact that it is another department that actually deals with that, but could we not put something in conditions surrounding it? Should it be the application be approved? I'm going to come to you, Liz. Thank you, Chair. Um, we could we could add an informative note that reminds the anybody who's operating the um, in the future that there are other legislation that they need to be mindful of. But I think we, it wouldn't be necessary to put on a condition for something that's already covered by other legislation. So um, that would be my response. Councillor, if you'd like me to do that. Very much, an informative note. Thank you. David Took. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to clarify who is going to be storing things in this self-storage unit. My, my immediate reaction to that was this is going to be domestic. This is going to be people storing a bit of furniture or whatever. Well, you look at it and the, 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 these things are 350 square metres roughly, which is 23 long wheelbase transits, just for comparison. So you get 23 long wheelbase transits to fill one of those units up. And that strikes me that the size of the unit is more applicable to commercial interests, so perhaps shops or somebody else. And that, who is it that's going to use these self storages? Is it anybody or is it, because if it's commercial, then you could get a lot more traffic moving up and down those narrow roads and they could well be large transit vans. So I'd just like a little bit of clarity on, on, on what we're actually expecting from that area. Thank you. For you, Chair. Thank you. Um, so there's no um, means of reasonably controlling what is stored within those um, buildings. Um, the potential users, as identified by the applicant, could be um, domestic or, or commercial. Um, it could be excess stock. It could be people, as you say, moving between houses. It's appreciated that they're large um, and that may be of particular benefit to people who want to be able to store their, their stuff so that they can gain easy access. <laughs> I wouldn't want to start speculating. But um, the, ultimately, if it's a commercial adventure, then if nobody wants to rent them, it, it won't be there for very long. Um, from a planning perspective, the question is, can these buildings be used for storage? The officers consider they can be. Um, it's for you to determine whether you agree with our assessment that this is an acceptable use within this location. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, I said my, my concern is, is the traffic, because that, that's the main issue I think that we're faced with, is the traffic on the roads. So what that traffic consists of. So at the size of units, it, it could well be used to store um, builders' materials, which will need lorries to move them around, or it could... There, there could be a lot more heavy traffic than um, Mr. Savage's assessment seemed to indicate. I think you talked about cars and light vans. The, si the size of these units would probably mean that you, you could quite easily get a, um, a, a truck, a flatbed truck with, with materials on it moving up and down these roads rather than a, a small estate car, which is the, the or a uh, a van of some sort. I, I, that just concerns me that, that how that traffic might work out in the long term. Come back. Through you, Chair. The, um, the analysis that was provided by the applicant, their assessment, um, was based on a computer program, which you probably will heard us highway experts talk about called TRICS. Now, TRIX is an analysis tool that takes data from across the country on similar uses such as this, so we can get a baseline figure for peak periods of traffic movement. The data they provided is based on, on self-storage facilities on the edge of town. There's no data available for more remote locations such as this, but the data does allow for all types of vehicles, large vehicles, light vans and cars. The finding, which we cannot dispute, is that the trip generation from their generic self-storage use 
will be less than is currently um, produced by the agricultural use of the site. The other point to bear in mind, Councillor, is that large HGVs have historically accessed the site. Flatbed um, HGV will also be able to access the site. Our contention here is that the actual number of trips by the larger vehicles will actually be reduced as a result of this development. Hopefully that clarifies matters. Thank you. Dave Morgan, did you wish to speak? You have your hand up. Oh. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I think I read somewhere there was um, perhaps a problem in, in large vehicles anyway turning and actually reversing out because you know if it's a narrow ac access actually coming in i mean is there space for these I mean, I mean if you had a big truck for example i can't see that the space for it to turn so it's got to reverse back out which could be interesting in some cases Uh, thank you, Councillor. The existing access, um, as I've alluded to, currently allows the passage of large HGVs, the sort of vehicles you would associate with poultry farms. And I can't be really an expert in poultry farming, um, but I have seen the large HGVs when they take the poor chickens into the site, mm -hmm. and they're huge. And they do get into this site access. There has been an element of overrun. But again, I'll go back to the point that I feel that the removal of these large vehicles or the, large, or the number of large vehicles of this type from the utilisation of this access is a positive in terms of safety. So we're confident that the access can, can work. I would concur with Mr Bennett's point that we haven't seen the swept path analysis, but we've got no requirement to ask for one because we have anecdotal evidence that it's been previously used by these larger vehicles. So I remember, Ken Bartlett, you wish to come back. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, this. At page 35, I think it's at 1515, table two, the summary of trip rate and traffic generation um, for the site is, is pretty low. But do we have that in comparison of what agricultural vehicular traffic across the site was previously? Um, you know, I have, to, I have to say that due to the exceptionally large storage area, what guarantee do we have that this wouldn't attract a brief to the storage area of HGVs due to the commercial capability of the site, as my colleague had already pointed out? Um, that, that, that would exist. I just wondered if do we have any data on what the amount of vehicular traffic over it, it was when it was the poultry farm and it was in agricultural use? Thank you, Chair. Yes, Councillor. The transport notes or the assessment provides a comparative analysis, so it provided the um, the actual figures that the applicant suggested were appropriate for this agricultural use. And it's on that um, comparative basis that we've then looked at the self-service unit, self-storage unit, and compared the two. So we have got some um, figures to it, and the indication is that traffic movements will be reduced as a result of this application. It's in the it's in the transport notes. Is you wish to come back? It's in the transport notes, which I've missed then. Thank you. I believe it's paragraph 1517. I think for the benefit of the public, just while you're gathering your thoughts, mm -hmm. it's a very short paragraph, so I'll read it out. The applicant has submitted that the existing trip rate associated with the poultry use is approximately seven trips per day to the barns, 50% of which are HGV or tractor trailer combinations. Whilst local objectors have referred to low current traffic levels, it is recognised that access to the agricultural site is unfettered and significantly greater trip rates could currently take place without the need for planning permission. <laughs> Agricultural use. Did you wish to come back, Shane? Councillor Barron. Thank you. Uh, i just like a little bit of uh, information about what is said in the conclusion to this thing, where it says, on balance, the application accords with the local plan and national policies when considered as a whole? Well, to me, either it does or it doesn't. Could you explain that, please? Could you, Chair? Yep. Thank you. 
So as planning officers, we have to look at all the, the, the suite of plans that go, um, planning policies that go together to make up the development plan. In this case, we don't have a neighbourhood plan, but we do have the local planning policies and the SPDs. Um, and uh, within the policies, we have to wait to how much um, the application accords with each policy and come to a decision at the end. So in, in each case, um, a, an application may not tick every box within the policy. So PC4, for instance, is a is a is a, a long policy with a lot of different aspects to it. And there may be some where the, the application ticks the box easily and others where it's a little bit more balanced. But ultimately officers have come to um, a decision that on overall it's a it's a pro Does that satisfy your? Uh, it certainly does. Yes, thank you. Do I have any more comments from members? Alex Brenton. Thank you, Chair. Just a question. Um, this is an application for storage units. If, or what is the definition of a storage unit? Could this be um, something like a, an internet company where this is where they dispatch from? and two whereas you don't actually have the public coming in but you know what's the def difference between storage and business units in that respect if just as a question i don't know you're talking more of a courier based yes yeah, or you know depot based Thank you, Chair. so um storage and distribution are two different uses that are both included under the use class b8 within the use classes order storage would tend to be the the main um, reason for placing your goods there is to keep them safe until you come back and get them another time. Distribution, you would be putting them there in order to potentially maybe do um, package them and then and the idea is to get them out to customers like Amazon or something. So in this case, the, the purpose is for storage. Self-storage just means that uh, the units would be rented out to individuals who would have individual access to them and um, the intentions of the conditions are to control that use. And the intention of the applicant, I think, in describing it as self-storage is to provide um, comfort that that is the, the reason. So it should somebody move into the storage unit and start using it for um, parcel delivery company, it would be a material change. It would contradict with the, the application description and condition. Yep, you can come. So, so therefore, if that began to happen, that is controllable. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Mike Dyer. Um, thank you, Jim. Um, I can see um, why this uh, recommendation is on balance um, because it's very difficult to substantiate um, a case that the applied for use will create more harm than the admittedly harmful existing use. So I can understand entirely why it's a non-balanced recommendation. And I think we've had a lot of debate and I think um, the stage has come where we've got to test the water. So I'm going to propose that we accept the recommendation to approve. Do I have a seconder? Excuse me, Madam Chairman. I'm sorry, I no, didn't Madam make it. Chairman, I registered to speak, and I have not been called. I have not been given your name, sir. Ask Mr Northover. I spoke to him on Friday afternoon by telephone. Your name is... McCorkle. You rang me back. I specifically spoke to your office twice. And you rang me back on Friday afternoon and said, yes, OK, I will register your request to speak. <clears throat> OK. Yes. Apologies. I understand that yes. you did register in time. However, I now have a difficulty because we're halfway through the debate. If you had said something earlier, it wouldn't be a problem. But I'm just, sorry, I did not understand your procedure. That's all right. Detail. Just bear with me a second. Then I'm going to come 
Okay. I can't ask you to provisionally hold his position on that until we've heard the yeah. speaker. As you can see, I'm getting a lot of info. Mm -hmm. Councillor Dyer, would you be happy to suspend your proposal and we allow this gentleman to speak? And so that's respectful. Yeah. So I don't normally do this, sir. No, I will allow you to speak. <clears throat> so please come and take the chair. You have three minutes. I will allow officers to respond to any comments that you make. Um, but that will be the end of it. There'll be no more public participation. This is definitely a, a one-off. Thank you very much. And our apologies for the error. Thank you, Madam Chair. Not at all. Good morning, committee. I wish to make some observations in raising my objections to this change of use planning application. My name is Nigel McCorkle, and I have lived in Gaunt's Common for 41 years. When I and my family first lived here, it was a quiet country village with very little traffic. You might even have called it sleepy. In recent years, the main road through the village has become a rat run, with particularly high volumes of traffic at peak times in the morning and evenings. The road is not very wide, which makes passing by cars a challenge at times. The introduction of large commercial vehicles, such as vans, trucks, or lorries, will only exacerbate this issue. I can only imagine what will happen if two commercial vehicles meet on the road, or worse still, a farm tractor towing a trailer. Furthermore, there are no pavements in the village. This makes walking in the village very hazardous at the best of times, and walking children to the village school particularly risky, especially in dark mornings and evenings. I should also point out that both in the village and its approaches thereto, there are a number of what I would call pinch points, where two cars, let alone commercial vehicles, find it almost impossible without one giving way to pass. Finally, and in addition, some years ago, main drains were installed in the village. The subsequent remedial work was very poor indeed. And consequently, the road surface is in a very poor condition. The increase in heavy commercial vehicles can only lead to further deterioration, resulting in persistent repairs, or worse still, resurfacing of the whole road, which actually is overdue, at considerable cost to Dorset Council. For all these reasons, I believe the proposed change of use is most inappropriate threatens the village and its community, and presents us with a number of unnecessary risks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, members, you've heard um, the additional representation. I'm going to ask officers, is there anything that has been raised that hasn't been covered already? I just... Are you happy for me to yes, make a comment, Councillor um, Chairman? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think I can appreciate the, the concerns that are being raised here. I, I, just to clarify and summarise some of the comments that you've heard from officers, we, we, we've had to take account of, obviously, the what we consider the fallback position of what the existing use is there. And we're not actually talking about new units that would not otherwise be there. If you were faced with an application for brand new units in this kind of location, there would be different considerations to bring to bear. Um, there are buildings already there. They have to have a use in some way or other. They have a right to be used in some form. So therefore, there is a challenge there as to what an appropriate use might be. And I think you've heard from the officers about the, the assessment of whether or not that brings additional impacts as a result of what is being proposed. So I just wanted to clarify that point as to how we've we've come to a recommendation that's before you. So I, I just wanted to say that that's not because it's disregarding that there would be local concerns around impacts that might arise from, from traffic movements there. Thank you. Okay. Debbie Chuck. Thank you, Chair. I just 
bringing back up some of the points that have been made and, and going back to what I said earlier, I'm still not clear precisely what self-storage is. So condition five, for example, says the use of the building shall be limited to self-storage only and for no other purpose whatsoever. What is precisely self-storage? How do you define it and how do you how do we understand what that is? Um, so self-storage is storage units that are available for people to rent or individuals slash commercials to rent. So it's so if I was a builder, I could store 10 ton of bricks there, deliver them on a flatbed, take them away on a flatbed twice a week. That'd be perfectly okay. That's within everything that's you're saying should be allowed here. Okay, thank you. Earlier on, Mike, we um, asked you to suspend your proposal to grant. You asked to speak again, so do you want to cover where you stand on that now? Um, I only wanted to speak to restate it because I understand the concerns expressed by the resident. But <clears throat> against that, you've got to weigh that there aren't any limitations on the traffic movements or size of vehicles under the existing use. So I came, I come back to the point I made when I made my original proposal. Uh, members, we have a proposal to grant. Do I have a seconder? That's about it. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I do concur with uh, Councillor Dyer with his earlier comments when he made his original proposal. And I think with the um, the original proposal that came in, uh, planning plan application that came in, um, would have meant a significant greater amount of vehicle traffic over the road. We're looking at a, a site that already has um, large HUV and agricultural traffic over it. And I think because of the sheer size of those storage units, they're going to be a commercial um, arrangement around them, I think, which would in all probability limit the amount of traffic and movement over that site. So I uh, taking into account the, the present use of the site and the impact that has on the environment with this proposal and this plan application, which would be better for the environment for that immediate location, I think, um, then I'm perfectly happy to second proposals on the table, Madam Chairman. Do I have any other members wishing to speak? David Morgan. Yeah, I'm, I don't know if I, if I, not noticed it but are the time limits on this i mean we can't have people going in there at midnight for example i believe they are and they are condition eight right. monday to friday 8 a.m to 6 p.m saturdays 9 a.m to 5 p.m oh, and sundays and bank yeah. holidays 10 a.m to 3 p.m okay i'm just david took and then Shane. Okay. they want to go to the vote uh, that's right. I, I, previously I was asking questions for clarity. Um, my view on this after listening to all of this is, is that actually the existing traffic use is reasonably limited. The potential traffic use with self-storage units and, 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 and the, the, the access that's proposed could, and I know I understand the, uh, the modelling that's been done, but I don't necessarily think the modelling is always that good. Um, I've, I've seen these traffic models before, and I, I, I can see a lot more traffic using these self-storage, and, and some of it could be quite big because the units are big. So I, th I think the actual traffic is, is a problem for me. Um, and condition five, uh, which I queried earlier, and the, with a clarification, it is, is almost pointless. Self-storage is, is, is just people storing stuff. Um, so I, 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 I really don't think this is a viable use of the site, um, and I don't think the traffic, that the potential traffic, is acceptable. So that was my view, and I was, I was, um, I am inclined at the moment to vote for refusal on this. That's not what we have on the table at the moment. However, we'll see how the vote goes. Shane. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, I, I, I neglected to ask about the informative note when I seconded the proposer's proposal um, and whether or not the proposer is willing to accept. He has already nodded in agreement that he would accept the informative note. Branding policy can have yeah. this in available materials. Thank you. So I'm going to move to the vote. The proposal is to grant as per the officer recommendation with the added informal note about the storage of hazardous materials. Those in favour of grant, please show, please. That is two. Those against? Five. And abstentions? I was late voting for. OK, so in that case, um, the proposal to grant falls. So I'm now looking, members, for another proposal, please. David Took. I propose we reject it. And your planning reasons for rejection? Um, unacceptable use of, of, village, of small village roads. The, the, the traffic impact. Were there any other reasons, or is it just those two? Um, that, that, that was the main one that occurred to me. I don't I haven't got a, an exhaustive list of reasons to to, to review it, but the the main one seems to be the potential impact on the on the roads, which are very small, very narrow, not able to take lots of traffic, um, makes it or uh, renders this unacceptable and unsustainable. Okay. Are officers content that we have valid planning reasons for refusal? Please, could we have some policies referenced? The officers are asking for some policy references. Um, I don't have policies at my fingertips, not being a professional planning officer. I mean, I can, if you give me 20 minutes, I can go and look them up. I've got them all online. In <laughs> order to um, help members, can I direct you to paragraph 15.1 uh, on page 31 and also paragraph 15.11? which might help you. Yeah, you can see that. Yeah. 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 So the same policies. Council Took, have you had the opportunity to read the suggested paragraphs and have I, they helped you at all? I am, I, and, and I think certainly the uh, benefits to the, the rural community, which is what PC4 talks about, um, are not, uh, don't outweigh the, uh, the harm, potential harm with, with traffic on the road. Um, People using these, I don't know who's going to use them. That's the point. There, there could be anybody, but there, there, there's anybody can use it. There, there's 23 transit van 
loads worth in each of these units. So they're big units. So they, they can they can take a lot of movement, a lot of a lot of so I think the traffic is the main objection and the uh, indicators of sustainability um, would show that industrial estates are far better for, for storage and distribution. Now, it, it, this is self storage only, but self storage, you've got to put things in storage, you've got to take them out of storage, otherwise, you might as well have tipped them. So, there's going to be distribution as well. And this, is, this, is, this is too much for these roads. Given the information that we've been given both by the applicant and our officers and the traffic modelling, I need to pin you down on to why you believe that all that information is incorrect. Um, Chairman, forgive me, but you seem to be requiring me to provide a report, the equivalent of the, uh, the, that of the planning officers. Um, I don't have time to do that. And you know full well that we don't have time to do that. So I'm, I'm a little curious as to as, as to why you're pushing this. I'm pushing like it this. because I want whatever decision we make is robust so that if we um, refuse this application, it goes to appeal. We have strong grounds to refuse that appeal because that was our decision. Yeah, so that's why I need to make sure that the reasons we give are material planning reasons that would stand up to scrutiny. The material reason I've given is the impact on the roads and the unsustainability of the location in terms of frequent visits to put things into storage, take things out of storage. Okay, taking you back to um, the beginning of section 15 in your report, 15.1 uh, um, the reasons for the previous refusal mm -hmm. were the application site is an unsuitable location for a storage, and they did have or distribution use of the scale proposed, which is inconsistent with the accessibility of the rural location contrary to policy KS2 settlement yeah. hierarchy and KS11 transport and development of the Christchurch and East Dorset local plan part one core strategy. Now, you okay. could reuse that wording that was um, on the previous application with the words or distribution deleted because obviously that distribution is not part of this application. Forgive me, but B8 is storage and distribution. It is, but I believe that this application is or self only for storage. storage. Or not self storage. storage. Self storage. But if you don't take the things that you're storing out of storage, what's the point in storing them? There's got to be some element of distribution. Now, whether that's storing it for a year because you're moving house or going abroad, or whether it's a ton of bricks that you're moving every I, two weeks. I think weeks, you've made your point no, very well. No I'm going to come to Phil. He wants to this <coughs> point. Thank you, Chair. Just to <coughs> deal with um, Councillor Tuff's point about storage and distribution, they are different uses within the same but within the same use class. So ordinarily, if you had a storage use, you could flip flop between the two without needing planning permission. But the, the, the conditions which were proposed in the officer's report to limit it to self storage <laughs> would prevent use as a distribution centre unless that condition was subsequently discharged in the future. And yeah. storage uses anticipate that the person storage storing the material will at some point remove them from storage. That doesn't turn it into a distribution centre. What turns it into a distribution yeah. centre is the person removing from storage I've, and distributing. I spent 30, over I spent 30 years with software for distribution. I understand distribution. All right, I've provided software for, for um, major transport companies. Yeah. Um, so, uh, sorry, so I was forgive me. I'm seeking to deal with storage. Yeah, storage and stuff. anticipates people removing them. So they're moving for their own use. Absolutely. So if I'm a builder, for example, I store 23 van loads of bricks. I can move them in, move them out, 
take them to my site, do whatever I want, twice a day if I need to. Is that right? That, that, would that be legal according to this? We'd have to, uh, if we were enforcing the conditions, we'd have to reach a to judgment about whether that was a storage or a distribution. No, I said I'm storing my own stuff. I own it, I'm storing it, and then I'm taking it away to use it. And yeah. Yes, that may work. Well. So that's self storage, but it, it it's not quite yeah. the way that the, 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 spirit. the spirit of self storage, is it? But it is. So I, I'm, I'm. There's no commercial restriction. Can I ask the members of the public, please, not to interrupt this meeting? I understand that you are passionate about this. I'm fully aware of, you know, the the looks around the room as various things are being said. I do appreciate it, but please, you know, we do need to make sure that we do this properly. But I, I, I would I would say fifteen one one um, is is still applicable. Um, 15, 15.2, 15.1.2, um, you do have information about the number now, um, there's only eight, but we still have no reasonable way to control trip rates, and there could be significant, there, there could be significantly more intensive use than the existing poultry farm, that's quite feasible based on potential use of these large storage units, self-storage units. So that, that's that's my grounds. I can ask Mike Garrity to come. Yeah, in. just bear, bear in mind that it's not just what the previous use was; it's what they would have the right to use the buildings for. So we have to bear that in mind. So we 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 want we would draw members' attention to the importance of defensible reasons. So agriculture. Um, and the reason why the storage use was referred to rather than distribution is because that specifically relates to the description of the development and what's before us and all the community. So. Yeah, but as, as as you pointed out, distribution yeah. is, is a where, where I, I buy think, things I in store them and retail. Clearly them. made your point now. Thank you. Is well, it, you keep asking the same question. It is a continuum, and it, so what point does it flip from one to the other? I think is is your concern. Yeah. Okay, so we have reasons for um, refusal, which reflect paragraph fifteen eleven and fifteen. Was it? 15 one, one and 15 15 one, one, 15 one, two, one, one, 15 one, two. Okay, so if members are happy with those as reasons. 15 one, three as well, to be honest. 15 one, two is amazing. One, three, Okay. Are you content? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we, we now have officers content that we have um, material reasons for refusal. So the proposal on the table is to refuse this application on grounds of the um, sustainability. Yeah. And I'm losing it this morning. Too many, too many moving parts. Um, so an unsustainable location, um, so inconsistent with um, policies KS2 and KS11, and also the scale of the proposal without information about the nature of future users or the um, reasonable way to control the trip rates, proposing an insignificant more intensive use than the existing single holding. And paragraph 15.3. Um, oh, sorry, 15.13. Yeah. Read 15.1 and 15.2. I don't think 15.3, because that is talking about it being acceptable. All the standard opportunity to control the hours of operation, the proposed is anticipated to result, so to result in harm neighbouring. Enabling immunity from increased vehicle trip rates. I think we'd have to accept that. Okay, yeah. so yeah. paragraph 15, one, thing. subparagraphs one, two, and three, as printed in your agenda, mm. as the reasons for refusal. Yeah. So we have that absolutely clear. Okay, that has been proposed. Um, 
Do I have a seconder? Yeah. Councillor Barron. Okay, so it's been duly proposed and seconded. Members, I shall go to the vote. Those in favour of refusal for those conditions. Five against, sorry, five for refusal. Those against the, the refusal of this application. One, two, and abstentions, one. Therefore, I'm sure the members of the public will be pleased to hear, this application has been refused. I'll move on to the next application. I will really <laughs> <laughs> stay for the rest. Thank you for your patience. We will let's start this morning. Please be aware of the trip hazard. That's only an hour. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, we shall move on to agenda item seven. And that is PFUL 2022-1864, Kimmeridge Car Park, Kimmeridge Bay. And for those of you that have the agenda, that's pages 45 to 62. And taking us through this one, we have Pete Waters, the case officer, and Sarah Barber, who is the landscape officer. So, Peter, over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can I just check everyone can see? Uh, the PowerPoint just before I get going. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is an application at Kimmeridge Bay Car Park um, for a seasonal change of use of parts of the car park for the parking and catering vehicles, providing a dining area and siting of associated temporary structures. Uh, the application um, has gone through the scheme delegation following an officer recommendation that runs contrary to the parish council's recommendation. Um, and that's why it's before you this morning. Uh, so the location site context, the site is located um, down in Kimbridge Bay in the car park, so on the, on the coastline. Um, as you see, Location plan shows that the site occupies the north uh, western end of the car park. Um, it's accessed via a private road, hence the, the red line obviously needs to go to the nearest public highway, which is where the private road ends and the public highway begins in the village of Kinridge. Excuse me. Um, so, just to give you an idea of the proposed layout, um, the restaurant would be situated at the southern end of the application site um, and the applicant has proposed some landscaping consisting of informal hedgerow at the northern end. Um, uh, originally the applicant had proposed some um, hedgerow at the southeastern end, however they have removed that uh, from subsequent plans. Um, so to give you some context, um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with Kimbridge, but just to, to make um, to make everyone aware of the sensitivity of the site, um, the entirety of the site is within the Dorset area of outstanding natural beauty, um, and it's within the designated heritage coast as well. I haven't shown that on the map because um, it would make it very difficult to see the other constraints in the area. Um, the site is adjacent to the Dorset Coast Triple SI. It's not Ramsar Heathland, it's Triple SI. It's shown in green on here. Um, hopefully, you can see that. It's overlaid by several layers, but that runs along here, and the application site is here. Uh, it's worth making you aware that Natural England were consulted, as you'd expect. Um, they have no objections to the proposal and its impact, or not, not having an impact on that Triple SI, but I wanted to make you aware that it's there. Um, as you'd be aware, we are next to the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site that is denoted on the plan in orange running down here. 
again, the Jurassic Coast Trust have been consulted on this proposal um, and advised that they have no objections to the proposal and do not consider that it will impact on the um, experience of the World Heritage Site. <laughs> Um, also worth drawing your attention, you can see um, on the plan to the south of the site is um, a red area. That is a scheduled ancient monument, the Allen Works scheduled ancient monument. Um, again, officers have spoken with Historic England um, who deferred to our design and conservation officer and our design and conservation officer has advised us that um, the relationship with the site and the scheduled ancient monument is acceptable. Um, finally, just to draw your attention to the other constraints that, uh, that members need to be aware of. There are three lists of buildings. You've got the Golter Cottages here. You can see the list of buildings are donated with stars. Clavel Tower, which you may well be familiar with if you've been down to Kimbridge, is also up there. They're all Grade 2 listed. And the Coast Guard Cottages, which is to the southeast of the site. Um, so again, I, I suspect many of you are familiar with Kimbridge, but if you're not, this is just an aerial image to give you a, an understanding. So the the Kimbridge Bay Car Park runs the expanse of this field, um, so this southern portion remains. This would be um, this forms the application site. There is also additional parking further down here, along with public toilets, um, and the access road goes up here. Um, the road provides access to the Kimbridge oil well, which is shown on here as well, um, as well as being the access to Kimbridge Bay and to the private residential dwellings on site. Um, so I'm going to take you a few through a few site photographs. Um, they're, they were taken by myself and also the landscape architect. Um, the majority were taken on my site visit back in April this year. Um, however, I've included some that have been taken in May 2022 and also on Saturday 27th of August. That's the August bank holiday weekend. So hopefully that will show you a bit of variety in um, how busy the car park is because as you'll see as we go through this presentation that is uh, a consideration when consider when looking at the potential impact of this development um, so this first uh, photograph is taken looking across the site you can see you have um, the, the car park is is informal in nature um, so uh, cars can park where they wish um, there is some hard standing providing access into the car park um, that's outside of the site boundary here um, and the application site runs along here. Um, so here we're looking northwest towards Golter Cottages. Um, design and Conservation Officer, as I mentioned, this is a Grade 2 listed building, but the design, design and Conservation Officer is satisfied that the distance is sufficient so that there wouldn't be um, an impact on the setting of the Grade 2 listed building there. Um, also worth mentioning that in terms of the relationship to the cottages, um, in terms of neighbouring amenity, uh, the distance is considered sufficient. The applicant has assured me um, that they will not need to use generators for this development, that there is um, electricity available from the site, so therefore there's no need for generators. Um, and in terms of noise impact, um, the applicant has also suggested that they would be willing not to use the site in the evening um, when clearly the area is quieter than it would be during the day when cars are parked there. Um, so the, the main the main points to draw your attention to aside from Gold's Cottages is how um, informal and open the area is. So Kimridge is slightly off to the distance. I've got a bit of photograph in it that will show you how you in fact it's, it, the site is disconnected visually from Kimridge all but um, and as you can see um, the informal nature of the car parking means that when the site isn't full of cars, it actually retains its informal and open character, um, which contributes to the tranquility of the location. Um, so the applicant has taken advantage of permitted development rights to um, put some food trailers there over the August bank holiday weekend. So this is taken on the bank holiday weekend. This is not an identical shot, but it is similar location. So you would go from a situation if permission was granted where you would have um, cars there potentially during the day when it's busy and then no cars to these trailers being there throughout the duration of the um, time period in which the plan permission applies.
So again, I've, I've uh, interspersed a couple of um, photographs together just to give an idea of, of the site. It's not, it's not perfect, but it just gives you an idea. Again, Kimbridge, the village is actually up there. Um, so you're functionally, or well, certainly visually, effectively disconnected from that village. Um, and the location retains very much a rural and open character. Um, so again, two contrasting photographs. One was taken in April, one was taken on the August Bank holiday. Um, it gives you an idea um, it, of, of what we would be looking at if members were minded to approve this application. Um, as you can see, you would also have a canopy here as well. The canopy hasn't been erected for the um, August Bank holiday. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the point that officers want to make here again is we're in the A and B or during the day there are cars parked there, but probably by about four o'clock um, the cars are starting to clear and then the, the location returns to that tranquil open rural setting. If you were to grant permission for this, you would have those structures there throughout the season effectively um, and officers do have significant concerns about the impact on the landscape character that that would result in. Uh, again, um, doing a little bit of uh, bringing photographs together to give you a, a view over the whole site. Um, but you should be aware that that obviously does mean that you've got a panoramic view. So this is just representative um, showing the site with Clavel Tower in the distance, um, looking towards the sea. And again, this was <coughs> in April. Um, and as you can see, this. These photographs I took at the end of my site visit, which was in the afternoon, so it would have been about four o'clock, I think, I was taking these photographs. And by that time, that part of the car park had pretty much emptied because people who come down to the car park, if they've got space, tend to want to park on the waterfront and have that view out to sea. So it's not the first part to fill up, if you like. Again, showing you a, a contrast um, of what we saw on the August Bank holiday. So you go from that situation where you have cars there, which will mostly leave to these structures, which would be there throughout the summer season. Um, and, and again, officers do have concerns that that is a material change of character, um, albeit for a temp on a temporary basis over, that, over the summer season that would lead to harm to the character of the area. Uh, so this is another one just for context, looking towards Clavel Tower. The application site is here on the right. Um, this again was taken towards the end of the day on a weekday in April. Um, now I'm down on the beach looking up. So this, um, for those of you who know Kimridge, you will know that this is the access down to the beach just here. Um, the application site, I apologise, I had meant to label this. The application site is up here. So officers do acknowledge that when you're down on the beach by the entrance that there would be very little visibility of the, the proposed development. However, once you get further out, um, and I apologise, especially as you're having to see this on computer screens, it's very difficult for cameras to kind of show you what the eye can see, um, and it is, it's very difficult to make this clear, but Golter Cottages are there, and the application site is here, um, and officers do consider that there would be a degree of visibility of the development once you step further away, because, because you've got the change in levels when you're very close to it, you can't see it because of the, the cliff face. But once you step a bit further back, there would be visibility. Uh, again, this is looking, so we're now looking effectively from the Allen Works Scheduled Ancient Monument. Um, so we're a little bit further away again. Uh, once again, you can see the car park here, Gold's Cottages, you can just about make out there. Again, apologies, it's, it's very tricky to show a large landscape area on a photograph effectively on a presentation, but mm -hmm. hopefully it gives you an impression. This was taken by the landscape architect in May, um, so we're looking okay. further into the season. The applicant had originally applied for um, mid-April to mid-September, um, they have suggested that they would be willing to um, shorten that uh, period of time. However, officers still contend that even towards the end of May, um, when we're not into the high tourist season, but we're getting there, the application site is here and it's still empty. Um, and it will vary on day by day, but the, the point to make here is that 
those structures would be here at this time. So there might be days where the car park is busier and it's less noticeable, but equally there will be days where it will be like this. Um, the weather was dry um, and, you know, there was nothing that I'm aware of going on that day that would have particularly prohibited it. <coughs> Um, again, some contrasting ones showing August bank holidays. So the application site in April. So this was earlier in the day, so you can see that the area is slightly busier. Um, this is August bank holiday, so the car park is busier on the August bank holiday, as you'd expect, um, and the structures are there. This is taking, we're going out towards the army ranges. So we're, I was approximately 600 metres away as the crow flies looking back towards the site and there would be some limited views from the west as well. Um, again, we're at this point, we're still within the AOMB and within the Heritage Coast. Um, I tried to provide three photographs here to, to show you different times. Again, I was hoping this would be on the big screen, so I apologise if this isn't as clear as it could be. But the first photograph in the top left was taken uh, on my original site visit in April. Um, the following one was taken in May when the um, when the car park was actually quieter and then the August bank holiday when the car park said it's busiest, but it shows it shows the difference in terms of what what is experienced at different times in that car park. Um, this is taken on the private access road. So what I wanted to highlight here is that there is actually quite a vista as you come down into Kimridge again, if you're familiar with Kimridge, you drive down the access road and the, the bay almost reveals itself to use a, a planning term, if you like, as, as you drive in and it becomes quite apparent. So if you imagine here, you would then have the structures and the canopy that is going to materially impact on your experience as you approach Kimridge Bay. And this Again, I, I would be interested to see how well you can see this on your laptops, but there are two photographs taken. They are the same photograph, one is zoomed in. This is now on the public highway, so this is before you even go into Kimridge. So uh, again, if you're familiar with Kimridge, you, you come over a hill and then Kimridge is, is down on the right hand side. Um, and again, you can you get glimpses out to the bay um, and you would get some far glimpses of the application site. Uh, this is taken uh, by the landscape architect on the August bank holiday and again shows from a different angle. So we're now up on the, the hill ridge on um, Robert Rice Way, uh, looking down at the site um, when the applicant used their permitted development rights to provide those temporary structures. So bringing you back to the plans, um, the application is not for takeaways. The idea is for a more a formal restaurant as you as you would imagine it and I've got a more detailed plan to show you in a minute explaining that. Um, uh, obviously one of the considerations here is that by converting this area into a restaurant you would lose some of your parking spaces. Now it is worth making it clear that this is a private car park. I have raised this with the applicant. They feel confident that they have the parking provision but in any event it, as it's a private car park it's in their gift to decide whether they want to use it for car parking or if they receive plan permission, they'd use it for this. So our officers do not um, consider that this is a, a matter that we can consider, given that it is a private car park, the loss of car parking provision. Obviously, if they chose to go ahead with this and they needed further parking provision, they would then have to apply to the council for a change of use of other land, which would be considered in its own right. Um, they wouldn't, but that again, that because it's private land, and not council owned car park. That is not a material consideration here. The applicant, uh, the application site does cover the whole of the red area. Um, so as it stands, we would be looking to approve a change of use of the whole site area. And the applicant has indicated that they would be willing to look at changing that. And if members were considering this, that would be something to consider at that time. But as it stands, that's what you're considering. Um, we would be looking at potentially the layout changing. So moving into greater detail, um, as I mentioned, um, instead of having some food vans effectively, which you go up to get your, your food and go away and sit on the beach, the idea being put forward is more of a formal affair. So you would 
you would enter here. These are a post and rail fence around the perimeter of the restaurant area. You would enter here. I don't know how whether the cursor is catching up, so I'm going to leave it there for a second. There's a host box where you would just as you would if you're going into a restaurant, you'd ask for a table for however many people are with you, and then you would be led to a table either under the canopy or out in the open. And then the food would be prepared here and there would be preparation there as well. And then toilets behind. Um, so this is to give you an idea of the elevations that the canopy would project four meters um, <coughs> up, in the, up in the air, so it would be slightly taller than the, the food units, um, but it would give you an idea. It's, you would see you wouldn't see it quite like this because there would be tables in front as well. Um, so the policy considerations when coming to look at this, um, the starting point in the perfect local plan is policy CO countryside. Um, I won't run through all of it. Um, it does require um, development to make a positive contribution to landscape character and enhance biodiversity. And it is your officer's opinion that the proposal as put forward fails to do so. Um, it does, the, the policy does allow for um, a, a new sensitive sensitive small scale employment or tourism use, ideally well related to a settlement or a complex of buildings. The applicant is proposing to, um, the applicant I should say is the owner of the restaurant in Kimridge, so this would be a, a satellite site if you like. Um, however, in terms of physically being well related to a settlement, as I've kind of shown in those photographs, it, we're not related to Kimridge at all here, um, so officers have concerns about that. Um, in terms of it providing uh, new tourist and leisure attractions, policy TA of the public local plan effectively refers us back to policy CO. Uh, policy D, design of the public local plan requires development to positively integrate with its surroundings and officers have concerns that we're taking a, a landscape that um, various points, not only during the day, but often for an, <coughs> the majority of the day, is rural and open and turning it into a more um, built form and officers have concerns that that may, results in it not positively integrating with its surroundings. Um, policy LHH, which is Landscape, Historic Environment and Heritage of the Public Local Plan, um, expands on that and requires proposals development to conserve the appearance, setting, character, interest, integrity, health and vitality of the landscape. Um, Moving on to a more national view, um, the MPPF paragraph 174 of the National Planning Policy, national planning policy Framework, beg your pardon, um, requires policies and decisions to contribute and enhance the local and natural environment by protecting and enhancing valued landscapes. Um, officers don't consider that this proposal would enhance a valued landscape and the AOMB Heritage Coast is considered to be a valued landscape. Um, Maintain the character of the developed coast. There, there have been some disagreements between officers and, and the applicant nature as to whether this would be considered undeveloped coast. But I think the point I would emphasize here is that at various points, as I said, during the day, um, you, you've returned to a situation where effectively it is undeveloped for all intents and purposes. Um, paragraph 176 gives more information about um, the AOMB, and we're probably well aware of it that we should great weight should be given to conserving and enhancing landscape and scenic beauty in areas of nat outstanding national nat natural beauty. Sorry, I'm get my words out. Um, so the starting point is that we need to consider um, whether this proposal conserves and enhance the landscape and scenic beauty in the area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, and your officer's recommendation is that we consider that it fails to do so. Um, the National Character Area Profile identifies the area as an area of tranquility. Um, it provides, uh, identifies opportunities for further enhancement, um, including managing the coastal strip and hinterland to ensure that new or existing developments neither impact upon the setting or visual coherence of the coast, nor pose a future threat to continued unimpeded natural processes. Um, in terms of the unimpeded natural processes, because 
I was looking at the shoreline management plan because Kimridge Bay is in private ownership. It is at the um, it's down to the owners of the land to decide how they deal with um, the natural processes. At the moment, they are providing their own private defences. Um, in terms of um, impacting on the setting of visual coherence, again, your officers are concerned that this proposal would um, impact on the setting and visual coherence of the coast. So moving on to the summary, um, I, I've gone through most of these, so I, I won't dwell too much on them. Um, I think the only thing that I may not have picked up on in, in terms of the balancing act here, there are economic benefits clearly providing the restaurant down there would provide uh, the applicant a state of 15 part time jobs. Um, they would be seasonal. Um, so that is a public benefit that members must weigh into whether they consider that the public benefits of the scheme outweigh the harm that officers consider would occur. Um, public rights of way, I apologise, I should have mentioned the, the southwest coast path runs to the south of the site. Um, the public rights of way officer doesn't object to the development so long as that coast path remains unobstructed, which is, is fairly standard. There is a mechanism if during the construction process the applicant needed to temporarily restrict it that they need to go through. <clears throat> um, biodiversity interests are acceptable. There are no protected species present on the site. Um, and the, the final consideration in terms of balancing is whether the um, impact on providing an additional facility, tourist facility, would outweigh the harm that officers consider occur. So taking all of that into account, it's your officer's recommendation that the harm that would be caused um, to the character of the area um, does outweigh the public benefits of this development um, and therefore your officers are recommending that the application is refused. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm going to move on to the public speaking element now and we have two public speakers, both the applicant and the agent. Which order do you wish to take it in? Perhaps if we could share the the, the time chair. Uh, yeah, you can. <laughs> Who's first? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, councillors. I have owned and operated Clavels Restaurant in Cambridge for 14 years and currently employ 28 local people. Our menu features dishes using ingredients from, from locally sourced farms and fishermen. Our supply chain reduces food miles and adds resilience to the local economy. The proposal for a pop-up restaurant called The Boat on the Bay takes its name from Kimridge Bay's full-time fisherman's boat, which is located in the bay. The menu will celebrate the fruits of his labour, such as crab and lobster, which we are incredibly lucky to enjoy. The setting for the proposed pop-up restaurant is within the established car park above the bay and would be a satellite operation with a shared team. Seasonal concessions have long operated at the bay, but these have had limited local provenance. For instance, a Mexican food van was stationed at the bay in previous years. With COVID swelling visitor numbers and the extended tourism season, we wanted to enhance the visitor experience to the bay and the quality of the offering. Many visitors to the bay falsely expect basic facilities, such as a shop or a cafe. In their absence, they often head back to the village in search of food or beverage to find that the restaurant village is already full. The proposed pop-up restaurant is intended to cater for existing visitors between the hours of 11 a.m. and 6 p.m., mid-May to mid-September. We do recognise that this is a sensitive landscape and that the character of the bay changes throughout the year, going from a honeypot destination in the summer to a more remote and wild location in the winter. I have spent significant time with Chapman Lilly Planning and the wider project management team on this application to arrive at a high quality scheme. The parish meeting clearly recognised this with respect to the landscape and officers acknowledge the thought given to the design of the trailers and our operational management plan, which sought to address any potential amenity issues. Thank you very much for your time and for listening. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, I wrote you ahead of the committee because I think there are a number of important points that uh, we want to try and convey uh, our proposal, not, not least some of the errors within the committee report relating to hours of operation and seasonal duration. I think Mr Walters has perhaps tried to, to retrospectively clarify those due today in terms of the length of the season now being proposed uh, and also the fact that evening opening is no longer proposed and in fact what wasn't from, from June onwards. Uh, so there are only narrow issues in contention and those relate to landscape. You will have seen in the officer report that the parish council will know the uh, site particularly well, have expressed their own views around that uh, and there was an awful lot of work that went into the application by means of a landscape and visual impact appraisal. I think you know, I don't disagree with Mr Walters that the, that the character of the bay changes throughout the season. Uh, that's undeniable. It is a, a wild windswept coast in the winter, uh, but during the summer months, it's exceptionally popular. Um, and uh, my brother-in-law lived at Galter's Cottages, so I've, I've spent many an evening down there, know it exceptionally well. And the car park is rarely empty in my experience during the, <laughs> the summer months. As set out in my letter to you, there is potential to address any residual concerns that you may have by means of condition. The proposal would give rise to an array of public benefits, and I was pleased to hear Mr Walters not just refer to the economic benefits in terms of employment, but also those in terms of the visitor experience. Um, this proposal, as you've heard from Ms Fernicum, is intri intrinsically linked to the surrounding landscape. In fact, the majority of the supply chain comes from the local farms, the fishermen. And so there is a direct correlation really between the proposal and educating visitors to the bay about that surrounding AOMB, the landscape it provides. And, and you have no objection for the AOMB officer or the World Heritage in relation to the planning application. I have given you a little leeway. You're already over your time, but if you'd like to sum up, please. In, in our opinion, the proposal does comply with policy CO and LHH of the local plan, uh, and we will respectfully request that you approve the application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you both very much. We have a written representation, the Chairman of Kimbridge Parish Council, Councillor Bird, which David Milko is going to read out. I am aware that it is quite a long submission, and again, once we reach the three minutes, I will curtail if it goes over. David. David. Um, from the Paris Council, um, in view of the fact that the reply of 21st of April 22 was already at the time that extension was agreed to allow us to call parish meeting, meeting on the 21st of April, the parish meeting gave careful attention to all the details of this application, in particular to the position of the landscape, its effect on the wider environment, and its contribution to maintaining a sustainable community in Kimbridge. The matter was discussed at some length, and there was no objections, and the meeting was unanimous in its support for the application. In response to the senior landscape architects, um, View. Um, starting from the west, there is an army centre gunnery range gate, the all well containing facilities, the car park with a large area of chippings and gravel, the quay incorporates the Nick the boat sheds. The proposal for the pop up cafe would be entirely within this busy developed landscape and not in our opinion detract from it. In the season and times of day when it is proposed to operate, Car park is anything but tranquil on fine days. It is now visited by many camper vans parked both on the fifth top as well as frequently in groups further back in the car park field, attendant noise and activity. Uh, Galter cottages may be listed, but this would not be for their visual appearance, which is typical late 19th century terraced housing. I suspect they are listed for their construction and historic interest. Uh, the gardens for real or west of these cottages are effectively screened from the proposed site by the cottages themselves. The photograph in the report concerning these aspects is from the nearly overgrown cliff path running on the seaward side of the cottages. The meeting, the parish meeting, did not therefore consider that the placing of the proposed cafe would materially detract from the appearance of these cottages. Ancient scheduled monument ironworks, 1980 excavation, is now entirely reburied in the boat park at the northern end of the quay in a survival rather than architectural interest. 
But the Earl's Tower is remote from the proposed site, and whilst Trevor's intent would be visible from it, they would not be materially more intrusive than the other man made items. Conversely, a cafe would not intrude on the setting of the tower itself. Uh, mention made of the southwest coast path goes through the car park, and therefore the proposed development would not adversely affect the visual experience in any material way. In conclusion, I therefore do not consider that the points made by the um, a statement of environmental opportunity would refer to this site, or it does, the intrusion will be minimal. I'll just go down to the conclusion. In conclusion, Kimbridge Parish meeting do not consider that this is a practical and undeveloped site to which objections might apply. Temporary structures will not materially visually detract from the other buildings, etc., in the bay, and the cafe will contribute to the settlement's sustainability by providing employment. For this reason, we reiterate our recommendation that the proposal should be approved. Pretty good timing. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for that. <clears throat> and our last speaker is Cherry Brooks, the local ward member. Again, Cherry, you have three minutes. Welcome back to the committee. Thank you very much, Chairman. Good morning, members, morning officers. Okay. Um, the applicant is a local business owner who contributes significantly to the local economy. Responding to a significant rise in visitor numbers over lockdown and since, she set about providing what's desperately needed in the area. The application is socially and environmentally responsible, sited close to electricity and water supply on level land, linked to the existing Kimridge restaurant, and has even commissioned a mobile food van that is a carbon copy of the National Trust vehicles used in AONVs across the UK. They could act easily have commissioned one that was much cheaper and less environmentally friendly. The application was developed with the Smedmore Estate, who own the land, and local residents and businesses. They currently employ 28 seasonal staff, which increased to 44, um, all local jobs. No objections from the AOMB or Natural England, fully supported by the Parish Council and the Smedmore Estate, yet more weight has been given to the Landscape uh, Report of DC. So that's only one real objection. This is not an application for a permanent site. It's exactly what we need to balance the service against keeping our landscape special. We need to provide for the influx of visitors who contribute to our economy. During the 28-day permitted development this year, they provided high-quality locally sourced food and beverages, fully functioning high-spec toilets, baby changing, first aid provision, free water bottle fills, dog water, mobile phone connection and a warm welcome to Dorset, all of which are expected nowadays and none of which were at local authority expense. The application before you is mid-May to September, but leaves eight months of the year clear. Since this was dismantled, there is no footprint. You can't tell it was ever there. My belief is that the benefits outweigh the harm with this model. I urge you to consider the overwhelming support from local residents, businesses and parish councils and return a decision of approval for this application. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, officers, any salient points that you wish to pick up from all of our public speakers? Thank you, Madam Chair, if I may. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a, a couple of points that I'd like to make. Um, the A and B comments. Um, the A and B officer said that they didn't object to the principle of something, but they then went on and gave a whole list of concerns that they had with this development. So I think. <coughs> That as being positive uh, and as supporting this application and again uh, the applicant and agent will, dis will disagree with that interpretation but your officer's interpretation of the A and B management team's comments are not that they're supportive of what's being put forward. Um, the second point that I'd like to pick up on is um, in reference to the, the um, provenance of the food and the um, local produce um, undoubtedly that is welcome however it would be impossible for officers to control um, and so while if permission was granted for this while that may well be the intention of the applicant there would be no way of prohibiting uh, the, the business being sold at a, a future date and the new owner of the business may come in and decide to um, to import their food from you know a, a wholesaler based in northern England in theory we wouldn't be able to control that um, so while 
as often as we welcome it, we don't consider that we can give that weight in the planning decision. Good morning, Council. Good morning, members of the public. Um, I'm Thinia Landscape Architect, and as part of this application, I did obviously assess the landscape visual impact assessment that was carried out. Um, a lot of the judgments that were made in terms of potential effects were um, judged against the car park being full and, all, and sort of at capacity. So I did disagree with quite a lot of the views expressed in that landscape and visual impact assessment in terms of the likely effects, because as we see today, the car park is a constantly changing beast. Cars come, cars go. If the weather's great, people will come. If the weather's dodgy, then you're going to get the windsurfing element. They're going to get a different type of traffic. But as we've said, this car park is relatively quiet during the mornings, quite busy lunchtime, mid-afternoon, and then it clears. So I would just like to sort of ask you to think about those the impacts of um, the mobile catering units, which are on site at the moment. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. You're supposed to be responding to points made, not okay. asking members to make considerations okay. at this point. OK, so in terms of landscape and visual impact, um, I do have some disagreements with the judgments that have been made. Um, I don't feel that this can be successfully integrated into the park um, site. And I do think that it's to the detriment. It's a very large visual envelope where people can actually view this site and they will view it from a distance. So they're going to be looking at this site in terms of the Coast Guard cottages, the bay, and then the Club Al Tower that sits up above. So when you start to introduce um, the proposed elements, you are actually introducing quite a notable new focal element into that view, which will be there every day for five months. So I would just... As I say, I, I think that the um, effects are certainly going to be larger than slight adverse. And um, it's not difficult, it's not easy to mitigate this because it is a blank canvas at the moment. If you start to introduce new planting, that in terms, that is in itself is going to change the landscape character of this site. Thank you. Okay, hey, members, my first speaker is Shane Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, thank you for your presentation, really good presentation. Um, I neglected to say that last time, I do apologise to the officers, but it was a really good presentation. Um, yes, I've just got a, 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 my first question is, um, the proposed site within the car park, um, I was pleased to hear that there wasn't generators involved, um, so there's power and water actually to that site. Is the intention to install a service column of some description? Sorry, install. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Second, install a service column. Uh, um, I, I, how sorry, you I, get it? if I can through you, Madam Chair, I, I know the site well, and I'm not aware of um, uh, any type of service column within that area of the car park. I know that there is power and water to the area, but uh, I'm not aware of a service column. And I'm assuming that that is the potential. The proposal is to install that. I would imagine. Um, I, the, there's no, <clears throat> excuse yeah, me, there's nothing yeah. shown on the plans in terms of installing um, such a service column. My understanding is that the facilities on site would allow, I mean, indeed, obviously, that's something that they have done with using their permitted development rights. Um, so I'm not aware that that is being proposed, and it's certainly not shown as part of the plans. So, yeah, okay, my, the reason for my question, Madam Chairman, is just to get an assurance that there definitely wouldn't be generators on site. As I'm well, I suppose to pick up on that point, if if members were minded to approve the application, it would be possible to put a condition on to the permission about restricting generators on the site. Um, so I'm assuming that would be a, a, acceptable to the applicant on the basis that they they've given us an assurance that there won't be those generators, but it would give that control to ensure that that was the case. Mr. Brenton. Can I just um, clarify, and I'm sure it's been said, uh, the proposal is April to September. 
So what happens in September? Does every one of those vehicles disappear? So what would be left over winter? I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, are we going to have a, a mini shed, which is in fact the electrical connection or such like? Um, will there be a above ground visibility after September? Yeah. Um, so the uh, the intention, the applicant's intention would be to remove all of the equipment once the, the time period ends. And again, I think if members were minded to go against officer recommendation, we would probably recommend some kind of planning condition to ensure that that happens at the end of each season so that we've got control over that. Uh, the only thing that obviously would remain, I've taken you back to the site plan, is the proposed hedging um, that would be situated on the northeastern end of the site and then um, running slightly on the other side of the access to the car park clearly you can't dig the hedging up each season it wouldn't it wouldn't be practical so that would be a permanent feature um Can I come back on that the hedging that would edge the road that goes down to co the cottages seems fine the sort of dog leg into the field seems unnecessary but there's also mention somewhere of a was it a post and rail fence um which i don't which then demarcates the front of the site um to me that seems a bit too intrusive um to the public use of the site the rest of the year um so i don't you know, I personally think that's a bit so there's no rule about taking out the fencing that's to the there, south of the restaurant over winter. Is that a temporary fence or a permanent post and rail? Uh, you, Chair. Um, so, I mean, the officers didn't consider the post and rail fence element would be unacceptable. Clearly, that part of it would have to be removed in order to return the use to car park, the bit that goes across. Uh, the midsection of the site, if you can see on the plan, which should be on your screen. So B2B. Yes, that's right. Um, there are obviously committed development rights for, for fences of, of that nature anyway, so that it, it's difficult to control that element. Um, so through you, Chair, in the winter, there will still be a sort of fenced and hedged off area at the top of that car park. Yeah? future uh, the hedge would certainly remain um the anticipation would be because the change of use is seasonal that therefore when that when that um time period comes to an end the use needs to be able to revert back to a car park um so the the expectation would be that the applicant would make sure that they could so to me you you could in theory keep the post and rail fence along the boundary of that area but you would need to remove that that central piece or else you potentially are in a situation where you're not reverting it back to its existing use so so at the moment there's, there's no yeah okay sorry um yeah. so yeah i've been saying post and rail i mean it's the post and rail apologies um <clears throat> there is no there's no requirement necessarily on them to do that. However, yeah, sorry, I was just I was just going to observe that if it's off season, that the demand on the car park is potentially less anyway. Yeah. Um, there's an issue there about well, in fact, it's private car park, so there's an operational issue for the landowner to consider whether or not that's a. We'd have to consider from our point of view whether there's a planning impact as a mm. result of that fence being left in situ, or whether there isn't, and it's not something that I'm aware of has been flagged up as a as a concern in landscape or design terms. So unless members felt strongly that they wanted that removed, if you were minded to grant permission, which you, we could potentially condition. Um, I, I guess it would be an operational issue for the landowner to consider as to whether yeah. or not they, they thought it was it was necessary to remove that if they wanted to accommodate more vehicles during during the off season. Uh, through you, it, my concern isn't parking or not parking because yes, in the middle of the winter, nobody parks up that corner. Apart from to get out of the wind, I've done that before now. Um, but what you could end up with is a sort of small holder blocked off area traditional 
you know, the way that farmland turns into pony paddocks. And I was just thinking that would make it a more domesticated scale if a little fenced paddock was left. But that's my, what's the word, prejudice. No more questions. Took your my next speaker. Thank you, Chair. I've got a couple of issues I want to explore, if I may. Um, first one is just to pick up on, on Councillor Brenton. Um, if a landowner wanted to put a fence or to plant a hedge, do they require planning permission to do that? Um, so they would, in terms of a fence, they would have permitted development allowances up to a metre. Um, it's not next to a highway, is it? Um, yeah, point taken. So then you would be entitled to go to two metres without requiring planning permission. So they could put a fence up. Sorry, through you, Chair. They could put a fence up and presumably they could plant a hedge of a limited height without planning permission anyways. I'm not sure if the hedge and the fence. Um, could I ask, is it possible to go back on the slides to 33 and 34? Just before you move on to that, who wanted to come in on a legal point? Please. Just to, just to, to expand on the answer on, on the question about permitted development rights for fences, they still have to be a means of enclosure. So you cannot just stick an isolated section of fencing up under permitted development rights. It has to form a, be a, a, a part of the enclosure. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I, I should know that. Oh. But, so if a farmer just puts up a fence to act as a windbreak in his field, is it that not allowed? Strictly speaking, it's it's planning permission. <laughs> I will, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will make it. I will make a note of that <laughs> for all my farmer friends. Let's Let's go on. Talk. Moving on. Moving, Moving on. on. Thirty-three. Um, principal, uh, I just want to run down this list and find out where where it is that we want to refuse it. So, principles acceptable. The scale design impact on character is harmful. AONB. Uh, impact benefit. benefit is outweighed by harm to the landscape. Impact on world heritage sites is acceptable. Impact on heritage assets is acceptable. Neighbouring amenities are acceptable. Access and parking is acceptable. And if we go to the next slide where it finishes off, I think the things there are economic benefits are, are all acceptable. So everything's acceptable. If you go back to 33, everything's acceptable apart from the um, scale design impact on character and the impact on A, O and B. Now, the parish seem to think that these are all good. These are, these are the people who live, work, know this best. So they are disagreeing with that judgment. And I think these things do come down to a matter of judgment uh, from people. So that everyone's going to have their own view. But it, it, it's... And I just wanted to ask, how the, the, is it possible to reduce the scale of, of the development? I mean, what, would, what would make it acceptable in the views of officers if the scale was reduced? To what level need it be reduced? Um, and in terms of the idea of economic growth benefit outweighed by the harm to the landscape, again, that's purely a matter of judgment. Um, I mean, we, we've had this on um, in the strategic and technical planning where we've had solar farms approved, even though they they, they detract from the, the natural beauty of our wonderful Dorset countryside. So there's only one thing there, and the only thing that seems to be turning it down is the way it looks and a, a fairly subjective judgment that that, that, that is required. Is that, is that a fair comment or am I oversimplifying? I'm going to interject on the first part of what you were saying is... I'm not going to get officers to answer that first question about what would be acceptable because we have to look and make our decision okay. on what we have in front of us today. Okay. I was, I was just trying to get a vision of yeah. but how until, high, is until it, is we it, know is it a million times too big or is it ten percent too until big? Until we know what else would come forward, it's like having a crystal ball. Okay. But that part of it, but the rest of what you 
are asking. Can, could I, can yeah. I just come in, Chair? Just a, a, a few observations from Councillor Took's comments there. Um, I mean, you, you've mentioned subjectivity of views, and I mean, the first point I would make is that it's it's not about the number of of representations or objections, whichever one way it goes or the other. It's about the substance of what the issue is that's being raised. The, the the subjectivity argument, I think we have to accept that there is a degree of professional interpretation of that as well, based on trained perspective. So we get we get landscape officer advice based on 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 a professional view, an expert view about what the implications and impacts are. So that and and if you then take that into account with the national requirement that we have to treat this as a nationally important landscape. And you'll have seen from the photographs and from your own knowledge that this is a, a valued location. So that's not to disregard the, um, the, the parish council's views, but we there is an element of, yes, there is judgment involved. And from the committee's point of view, if, if I were to summarise where I saw the judgment being, is, is you're, you're faced effectively with a situation where officers are advising that we consider that there is an impact on the the, the, the landscape character of the AOMB, set against what is undoubtedly some form of economic and tourism benefit arising from what's being proposed here. Um, now, Mr Walters did refer to the fact we can't control the, the provenance of where that the, the food stuffs come from, but nevertheless, you have a local business that is supporting local people and is offering something that the tourists will benefit from. But you're in an extremely sensitive part of 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 the coastline here. You're you're in a, in an AOMB um, where you're you're looking at a particularly sensitive part of of the coastline. So so that's why there there has been a balancing act in the in the advice you've received um, that there would still be. A residual impact that we consider would outweigh those benefits. The judgment for you is, is do you mm. agree with that? And taking account, <laughs> do you believe that those economic benefits and tourism benefits are sufficient to outweigh that? So that, that was just my take on that, but I, I thought that might help just to focus the debate yeah. um, rather than maybe getting involved in discussions about the, the details of some of the defencing or things like that. Yeah. Do you want to come back? And then I've got Shane and Alex. Um, yeah, and you're quite right. Um, AONB is important, um, and, and just just for clarity, um, I did a degree in archaeology a little while ago. Part of which is looking at sites, ancient monuments, and the views to and from, and planning considerations. Was all part of the university course that I went to. So I, I understand exactly what you're getting at there. Um, the AONB team. Um, do suggest that a time limited consent might be worth looking at. Um, and I might come back to that later on in the in the debate. Um, but thank you for your explanation. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I, I, I want to pick up on the catering trailers. Um, one of our speakers said that the catering traders were the same that was being used by the National Trust on their AOMB sites. And I appreciate that every AOMB site has to be taken on merit. They're not all the same, obviously. I just wonder whether the officers were aware of that. And also, um, when we looked at the photo, um, those catering traders were brown. Is that the colour that the catering traders are going to be? Are they going to be brown? I mean, green would have, to no. my mind, sat, sat better within the landscape. Mm. No, I think brown is better. Uh, um, uh, so uh, in terms of the catering trailers, the planning application and the description of development is for a change of use and the siting of associated trailers, uh, uh, sorry, associated structures involved with it. So you would be granting planning permission for the use of the land because they are temporary structures. Um, so although that may well be the intention again, unless, unless we we had some measure of control over that there would be the potential that you know if, if one needs to be replaced it could be replaced with anything um so there there is the possibility if members were minded to go that way that we could look at some form of condition if that was something that members felt would be appropriate but as it stands the application submitted is for a change of use so we wouldn't have immediate control over that yes. So, but a condition could be put in in terms of the visual impact of those of those trainers in terms of colour and 
Thank you. Alex, can we get to general points now? Because it's not really it's not really a question. No, the floor is yours. But it's just observations. Point one, Kimbridge is screaming out for a cafe or an ice cream van or a something, which it gets most summers, and they're usually fairly the sort of thing you could find at Swanage Fair or something. It's nothing particularly exciting. Um, I'm, I have to admit, I'm a regular to Kimbridge as a swimmer, and when you swim out into the bay and you look back up this summer, we're unusual. We've actually been able to see what the effect of these buildings are, whereas so many planning applications, you have to take a picture or you have to take a drawing and pray that's what you're going to get. It's been quite interesting to see these pop up. And when you're out in the bay, um, at sea level or in a low boat or st stand up paddle boarding, though I can't do that, I have to admit, I'm only in a kayak. Um, I can't, you could can barely see these um, trailers. And I'm quite happy. Uh, uh, my colleague said, well, wouldn't it be better if they were green? And I'm thinking because of how dry that site can get, even in most summers, I prefer the brown. So I'm in favor of having some sort of condition on light brown beige. The same goes with if you're going to have um, the awning, I think the sort of sandy colour or beige is better than pure white. We don't want to make the place look like a festival, though we have had those down there too before. Um, but I think most of it comes down to when people go down to Kimmeridge, those who are regulars take the thermoses and their sandwiches, but an awful lot of holiday trade comes down and assumes there'll be a coffee shop, uh, assumes there'll be somewhere you can buy something. And if there isn't, they do go back up to the village proper and then find it's quite difficult to get served because they're so busy up there. So we have traffic shunting up and down, looking for things that aren't there. And in fact, if you can't get there, you've got a three mile drive round to, to the next pub. So we may actually, if you have a, a facility in the area, actually in the bay, um, you may get in a way less traffic shunting up and down a very narrow private road with a quite steep drop off on one side. Um, so I think the, the general principle of having some sort of coffee shop there, some sort of restaurant there is a good one. Um, as it stands, we could have ended up with anything. We could have ended up with some sort of tacky trailers all summer. We could have ended up with applications to change down at Fine Foundation on the slipway. That would be another site, but I'm sure that would be objected to because it's next to, you know, closer to the tower. If they were, if they converted one of the Coast Guard cottages into a cafe, I'm sure we'd get complaints or mutterings because that is a listed building. And so actually having something sort of between the two sides of the village or sides of the bay seems perfectly logical. And we always have to bring down to the fact that although we see it as a wild and open and des desolate area, it's a flipping industrial area. They've been carting oil off the place for years you know, they coped with all this sort of stuff. We coped with big tractors and trailers. Um, the scale of Kimmeridge is quite large. It can accommodate quite a lot. I know that's its beauty, but we can accommodate it. And I think a facility like this would be very, very useful. I know other people might comment about visual intrusion, but I think for me, the benefits of having a facility there outweigh the possible harm, particularly as for most of the year, it's not going to be there. It's not going to be there in the winter when I'm walking the dog, so that's fine. Thank you, Chairman, through you. I'd, I'd just like to maybe pick up on a few points that were raised about the materials and the appearance of the... It's, it's a little bit tricky when you've got pop-up units like this, because the very nature of them is that they're there to be temporary structures brought on site as and when um, so, so we're, we're not we're not talking about something that's going to be 
designed by Mies van der Rohe. You know, it's actually going to be a pop-up structure and it has to be appropriate for what it's doing. I think from our point of view, where we would have a certain concerns around this would be about the extent of the red line and potentially the number, because we're talking about the use of the land, how extensive and intensive that becomes and whether or not that then becomes a bigger problem than what's there. So if if members are minded to approve the application, I think we would probably prefer to be looking at a condition that talks about the footprint of the the actual buildings within the red line area, the number and extent of those those um, units have to be agreed. Um, the sort of things that we can then actually control and ensure that it doesn't intensify to a level that the harm goes beyond a point even that we already know about as, as officers have advised. So I think that would probably be a, maybe a preferable way of looking at it um, and, a, and a way that then, then you can be more certain about what the extent of that impact is in terms of judging that as far as the A and B is concerned. But Shane and then David come back. Other members are welcome to take part in this debate, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Garrett, you got there before I did, because um, that was one of my concerns was about the size of the of the footprint of the area we're looking at, and I wondered whether if we were minded to approve this in some form or another, and um, I, I am minded to um, take serious consideration into page 56 of 15.20 uh, that surrounds the uh, idea of a limited planning period is to ascertain it. Um, because of the economies of of the of the area and the impact as on the OMB, but I'll, I'll come to that later in the debate. But in terms of that um, curtilage of the proposed planning application area, um, from what I understand from what you said, Mr. Garrity, that if we were to approve this in some form or another, then that could be subject to the applicant and the officers coming to an agreement on to what size that area should be. Yeah, these conditions to which I'm more, more comfortable with. Thank, thank you. David. I was going to say similar. Um, this is a change of use. So we're not looking at full application, outline application, reserve matters, simply a change of use. Is that right? So we, we, we're just saying we're going to allow this use on this land. But there's still a full planning application. It's a full planning application. So if we had a full planning application and we said we would limit it to three years, five years, whatever, with conditions on materials, the way it looks, um, the visual impact, and all the things that, are, that, that concerns have been expressed about, is that something that uh, officers think would be possible? Can I just ask a point of clarification? Are you talking about a temporary consent? A, a limit, time limited. I, I, so is that time limited for the number of years of operation or is that yeah. time limited of the hours of operation? I, I think the hours of operation have been discussed right. already. They're, they're, are they not in the document? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, no, it, it's terms of years. I'm, I'm saying a, a temporary permission. Temporary permission, three years, five years, whatever might be appropriate. And, and if at the end of that period of time, it proves it's no, worth, it's then apply to continue. Do if it does, to speak then you don't have to do it. Doesn't we can we can knock it on the head? Is that? Thank you, Chair. I guess it would be be useful to to give members some guidance about temporary consent as it's been raised. So temporary in terms of the number of years, as Councillor Tip said. So the planning and practice guidance, which is the government's document which supplements the MPPS. Um, says that circumstances where temporary permission may be appropriate include where a trial run is needed in order to assess the effect of the development on the area or it's expected that, that the planning circumstances will change at the end of that period. So I think if, if you'd be looking to um, approve it with a temporary period, you'd need to be clear about what element of the development is subject to that, that trial. What, what do you need it to prove that you don't know now that um, that you would you would look at at the end of that temporary period if another application came before you to say has it succeeded or has it failed in terms of why we imposed that temporary permission. Thank you. Really looking at it. Um, thank you. I, I, I go back to what the AOMB team said, which is that they had the AOMB team 
advise a town to consent to fully assess impact. So I, I think that that's the grounds why we or why I'm suggesting that. I think I think and, and in terms of clarity, th these are temporary structures that they're they're, in, they're going to be removed out of season completely. So the difficulty you've got with that line is that there has already been some temporary use on the site among the 28 day permitted rule and there is photograph evidence of the trailers on site and in use and there was also um, some from the agent that came through on the email which actually showed a photograph of a canopy in use on the site yeah. so you've got enough visual evidence already to be able to make that judgment okay i, th I think going for a temporary would prove difficult Okay, thank you. Yes, I, I, and I saw the, the photographs on the on the presentation, mm -hmm. uh, and and they it, it didn't appear intrusive to me on those photographs. So I am edging towards um, giving permission for this. Do you wish um, to make a proposal? If, I don't have any other speakers at the moment. Okay, and Alex coming back again. So <laughs> that was edging. <laughs> edging. Same. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, as we've already ascertained, this is this is down to an individual's subjective view on on the site. And when I look at the photo, um, I do see that in terms of the visual impact on the site, it's it's quite stark. Um, and, I, and I would agree to that. Having said that, I said and I would then take into account in terms of the economical benefits to the area. In the coastal areas, we know we see deprivation within coastal areas because obviously a lot of their economy is seasonal based. So coastal areas, we do know they struggle with their economies. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly disappointed that with the site that we're looking at and knowing the area, and, and as with Councillor Brenton, I, I visit Cambridge and I visit Cambridge and Exeter in my lifetime on a regular basis. Um, and it's, a, it's disappointing in that if this infra infrastructure is being put at the other end of the car park, where there is higher hedges and, and scrub and woods, I'm being mind and careful where I'm going with this. You know what I'm going to say. Yes, you still I know. Deal with what is before you. Know. Um, and because there is already permanent structures in that site with the toilet block, then I think for me as a member, that would have been more comfortable for me as a, as a, as a more of a, a permanent option, or, albeit on a, on a temporary basis through the seasonal period. Um, and that that would have sat better with me. The fact is that the proposal that we've got in front of us is where it is. Um, I concur with Councillor Took, my colleague, um, about the temporary um, limited planning and um, possibility. And I appreciate the fact that there's been other things on the site, but we're going to make a decision that would make this over a much longer period of time. Um, in terms of a permanent basis over the length of operations that this could continue over years and years and years from now. So we need to make the, an assurance that we get the right decision. So I would propose a limited um, consent order to assess the economical impact on the area. And my argument for that would be that the, the additional associated noise impact um, adjacent to Gultier cottages and the displacement of cars within the reduced park and, and avail avail availability create an impact on those members of the public within the wishing to visit the site and to ascertain from the public opinion what visual damage impact the infrastructure has and had on the AONB through surveys and or complaints to the statute planning authority Dorset Council and I think that fulfills a lot of the concerns and leads a way forward to us getting a better decision two years from now as to whether we can actually approve this as a, as a permanent plan application. You can tell me that? That's fine. The temporary consent effectively. Yeah. yeah, I think I think the, the the thing to bear in mind for members is that therefore you would be expecting the applicant to come back in two years to have to apply effectively to renew that or seek re, um, basically to relax that condition if if the evidence was pointing in the way that it was acceptable effectively. I think also that if you do grant a temporary permission, 
then you need to be absolutely sure on the conditions you apply to that. Because if you get it wrong when they come back for something permanent and you didn't object this time round, you'll have difficulty in changing what you admitted this time round. I've got a manchemetry. I've got a series of conditions I was going to add to that. Would you like to hear those now? I think it would be very useful because once you've gone through the conditions, we then need to look for a seconder. Okay, so the conditions were that um, sufficient, sufficient fencing would be removed to enable car park operation at the, at the end of the period of, of the operating of the of the restaurant. Um, evening hours of operation um, need to be considered, and I've, I've written down here eight or nine p.m. But yes, that would be obviously it's it stopped at six now. Six o'clock, then, Madam Chairman. That's what it is. Um, no generators on site. Um, the trailer cover um, to be approved in any future change of use. And conditions subject to officers agreeing to the size of the curtilage of the area. I have some additional things for you to consider. What happens? outside of the permitted trading window. So between mid-May and September, do you want the site completely cleared of all paraphernalia? You need to consider the proposed canopy. Is it just one? What's it made of? Whereabouts? Um, the number of trailers, because you're at the moment you're allowing trailers. So do you want to have a limit on the number of trailers? The um, location of the trailers, the canopy and the seating. Are you happy with the number of covers proposed? Do you wish to have an upper limit? Obviously, any landscaping details? What about um, lighting and PA system or music, yeah. waste management, all the sorts of things that go hand in hand with all these sorts of operations. So do you need time to consider those issues? Madam Chairman, um, yeah, I did forget the music one. Uh, I must confess, um, there'd be no music on site. Um, but that would, I think, have a significant yes, and detriment yes. impact to the to the local mm -hmm. environment. Um, the trailers that's laid out within the, the plan that we saw is, is the upper limit of trailers. That's I'm true. assuming that the applicant has that's considered that that is the number that they need to run the operation. Um, the cover um, would be within, within agreement in terms of mirror materials and specification. That cover would be within agreement between the applicant and the officers. And as I said, the the fencing, sufficient fencing room really to allow the car park to still be operational. I think it would be um, unreasonable to expect the applicant to remove all of the fencing, but sufficient fencing to be removed to make the car park operational, I think is is reasonable. I covered everything, Madam Chairman. <laughs> you can be sort of there. The number of covers. The covers, I think, Madam Chairman, I think, I think it's that, in 100. That, that would be I think that would be borne out in the period of time that we're assessing this over the next two years um, as to whether it's economically viable or not. Mm. So you, you wish to have an upper limit. Again, mm. I think that was that was something that can be done through uh, um, officers in discussion with the applicants. I'm not an expert in 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 the restaurant okay. field. Mm. They put in I don't, Peter, but there's, there's, there's an issue that the footprint of the site is in itself will provide some degree of limitation or and and, and obviously for anybody operating that the flexibility to some extent is is a normal part of any operation. Mm -hmm. So if we were limiting the numbers, we'd be wanting to be clear that there was a sort of planning reason why that number was being restricted because effectively the it's not per se the use it's the visual impact of the of the, the buildings or the structures that, that that's the, the concern here. 
So if we're controlling the other aspects like the number of, of mobile units and the, the, the footprint of, of where those are going, um, then unless there's a specific issue you have with the number of covers, that may be, may, may be going a bit beyond what we necessarily are, are concerned with. But I, I'll take Peter's view on that, whether you feel that there's a particular concern that you've come across in dealing with the application where the number of covers was a was it was had a, a specific issue in relation to the impact on the visual impact, I suppose, the AMB. Or if you just bear with us a second. Just while officers are yeah. having a comp lab, it, we're coming up to one o'clock. Yeah, I know. Um, I know we started late. However, we still have two more applications after this one. So I need to know from members how you wish to proceed. And um, whatever happens, I suggest at the end of I hope we would take this one to conclusion and then have a break. But it's how long a break you want and whether you want a lunch break or a comfort break or whether you want to refer the remaining items to a future meeting. Julie had a hand up first. I've got a hospital appointment at quarter to two. That's fine. Sorry. That's, that's always the issue when we overrun. Not a problem. But if you could stay to the end of this, it would be. Yes, I'll go down. Yeah. Fine. Sorry, Madam Chair, we take a 10 minute comfort break at the conclusion of this application and then we continue with the rest of the meeting. Did you want a finish time or are you happy to leave it open? I'm in your hands, members. Are you happy with a 10 minute break and then take through to conclusion? Yeah. 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 That's what we'll do. Thank you. We're just waiting for a response. Yeah. I was just going to say, are things like materials, covers, colour not included in the original application? Yeah. Yeah. Officers. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, responding to this this matter of the number of covers, I don't think, I mean, this is obviously yeah, expressed their concerns good. about the development as a whole, but if members are minded to approve, I don't think the number of covers is going to make a significant difference. But what officers would suggest um, as a condition is that at the end of each season, that the land must be restored, so it might need to be reseeded and what have you, because inevitably by having those structures in place over the summer, you've got an area that's currently to lawn, it's going to die away. Um, and so there needs to be some remedial work because for the rest of the, you know, the other seven months of the year, that land is going to be open. So officers would suggest um, and recommend if, if this is the way you want it to go, that you consider a condition, an appropriate condition to ensure that the land effectively is restored, restored each, at the end of each season. Would that come under a landscaping condition? Shane then Alex. Thank you. Um, I take your point with the um, putting the land back receding and what have you, although. <laughs> Not me for a change. So, although, although, although I would say that the photographic evidence and you can only photograph the car park with what's in the car park at the time you go to photograph it and i appreciate that's what the officers have to deal with but there is hundreds and hundreds of cars normally within that car park and that grass copes fairly well but i take the point that it would need to be reseeded um another condition on it would obviously be and i don't think it was in there it may have been but no food or drink to be taken off the site so that we can actually preserve the the precious environment that it's actually sat in in what you can't walk away with these sandwiches Sorry, but, Chair, um, can I also suggest that it might be wise on that um, to condition um, disposal of physical waste and there's, there's no sewer down there, so also the removal of wastewater as well to make sure that we've got control over that. Um, I'd just like to put that forward as a suggestion if members of mine to get this way. Thank you. Mm. Alex. Um, just... I, I totally agree with all the various conditions, but I'm just point, pointing out that this is quite a financial commitment, especially now where we're saying you've got to do this, you can't do that, you've got to do this. Um, so I would suggest that two years is long enough in order to commercially break even and, and prove that this business is sustainable. I would say it should be more like four years. You know, because there's quite an investment going on, I was just thinking. And we don't want it to fail because they don't have the continuity. You're almost straight into the point of if you're going to go four years, why are we doing a temporary consent? 
Well, I'm th well, all right, three years, but you've got to you've got to prove you can make an income off, off this and that it works. And I was just just thinking that two years was a bit tight. I guess from an observational point of view, there's there that some there have been temporary facilities run there um, on and off. So in terms of the level of investment, I, I'm sort of. I'm assuming that it could be made to work if I mean, I think the consideration for the committee is whether or not you feel there's a need to put a temporary consent on to monitor the impact because you are concerned mm -hmm. about that impact. Mm -hmm. And that if that's the motivation, then we don't want to give a, a period of time that we can't have to a full a permanent condition, because then the question is, why would you bother as, as the as the chairman has pointed out? Um, Two, two to three years would seem a more appropriate window of time, in my view, in that respect, if you want to actually give yourself a window of time to assess what the impacts are without being unduly restricted on the, the commercial aspects of the... Within any period of time, it's open to an applicant to apply to relax that condition if there are good reasons to, if they feel in advance of that, that they wish that to be considered. David. I'm... I think persuaded by the argument that there's not a lot to be gained by temporary consent, time limited consent. Um, and, and, and I think given the sort of conditions that, that uh, Councillor Bart has proposed, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't um, approve the application. So where we are at the moment is we have a proposal to grant a temporary consent. It has not yet been seconded. I'll second. Thanks for what I was going to say. <laughs> Just get on with it. <laughs> uh, Go on. Through, through you, Chair. I was just going to, before, although the, the, the vote is slightly settled, um, I think before we, certainly before we take the vote, we need, need the members to be aware of what the precise proposal on the table is. So including all the conditions that the proposer and the seconder think are, are appropriate to go with with that proposal. And I just think for, for everyone's certainty, we probably just need to read run through, run through those. Yeah. So, for example, um, Councillor Bartlett, I, um, one of the conditions that the, the chair mentioned was uh, conditions to do with lighting. I think also need to consider whether you feel the submitted biodiversity plan should be complied with. Um, and, and then just confirmation of other suggested conditions. So the plans discussion we've been having, the months of operation, hours of operation, that's the that you've been discussing. On the conditions, if I may. Go on. Why we're we worried about lighting? It stops at six o'clock and it's not operating in winter. There's no lighting needed, apart from possibly internal to the tent for the people working. That, that's. I don't see lighting as an issue. Sorry. Good point. So. The conditions that I have listed are not in any particular order. No takeaway. No music. Trading must finish at 6 p.m. during the window of operation, which we already heard would be from mid-May to September. And the intention, I think, from the applicant was to start trading at 11. So, do you wish to have a start time? Can they trade from eight o'clock in the morning? Can they trade from six o'clock in the morning? Or uh, <laughs> it's on the report. Can't stick with the times on the report. Or the the applied. Okay. It's in the evening from mid-May to September. And is that the thirtieth of September or the first? What was the application? Original, original application was April, wasn't it? Because it was Easter. Yeah, mid-May. Mid no, we, we said, I think the 30th. Was that the 30th? 30th of September, September yeah. was the end point. So we need the start date as well. So mid-May mid is what? Easter, Three. I think. 15. Oh, is it this? Because <laughs> otherwise it's... it's Excuse me, Chair, why are we inventing this? Is it not all of this in the, in the report, report somewhere? What they no. Were 
the, the report is up for refusal. This application. Oh, true. We and we are right looking to yes, overturn the refusal of the, the grant. I want to clarify so that we are precise in the conditions that we apply to this going forward. So, so to, sorry, Chairman, through, through you to, to try and answer Councillor Tuff's point, we're seeking to, to ascertain from members what conditions they think are necessary to make the development acceptable. Um, and it's up to you to impose those that you do and those that you don't. So you've already given an example of those that you don't like lighting. Um, and um, perfectly reasonable for you to say, to, to give the headlines of the conditions that you wish to impose and, and delegate the precise wording to officers. And you, you could, if you wish, delegate that to be through officers in consultation with the chair and vice chairman, if, if you thought that was appropriate. So we're, we're simply looking for the headlines. Okay. When I would have said how is the time of opening surely ought to include the May first of May bank holiday because that's when things kick off in Dorset. So are we going why are we did somebody say fifteenth? Is it yeah. Yeah. Chair, um, the applicant had come back and suggested originally they had suggested mid May until mid September. They had then come back with a revision saying uh, mid May instead of mid April to mid September. Um, so that's where that has come from. Obviously, as members, if, if you want to change that, then you have that opportunity to. But that was what they had put forward. But it was mid April originally. Mid April originally. I'm but, thinking um, May. <clears throat> So, do you want to include May to September in its entirety? Yes, Madam Chairman, for, for, for clarity and for simplification, we'll do the entire from the 1st of May to the 1st of September. Okay. So, going through the other conditions that you talked about is having the fencing removed to a point to enable the car park to resume operation. Sufficient yes, Madam. The size of the area to be used. Um, the number um, of trailers and their appearance to be delegated to officers. Uh, no generator on site. Um, waste management was the last one we talked about. Um, the canopy um, is about the do you want the details of that agreed with officers about materials, materials and location? Yeah. And then the other thing I've got is remedial work to the bare patches at the end of the trading season. Yeah. Feels to be made good. Uh, yes, the, is there anything else? the other point was the, I suppose, the footprint of the site as a whole. Yes. Push back up. Um, because the red line encompasses a, a much larger area, so so effectively we'd be saying that the, the extent of the de the details that were submitted, we would um, effectively make the site to reduce that. So to to come to ensure that the, that has to be by condition, because the, the actual use of the land, if just the description, of the development, and that that won't control that. So if we if you don't want the entire site to be covered, that's shown within the red line then we would want a condition just so officers can come up with a suitable wording around that condition about what the footprint of the, the site that's approved um, for, for operation purposes three, is. Madam Chairman, that also controls the number of covers as well to be sufficient between the officers and the applicant. Thank okay. you. So are members happy with those proposed conditions? Uh, <laughs> I've got two directions. You first. I think, I think Peter also mentioned the possibility of whether members wanted a waste management, wastewater. Yep. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, we got that. Sorry. sorry. I was just going to check the last one was at the discussion of the number of covers. Is that correct? No, no, we're saying no. we don't need to do that. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that will be part of delegation. David. All refuse to be removed at the end of each day. That, that's a waste management plan. So. Okay. I'm sure they will take that on board. Yeah. Don't want um okay so you have proposed temporary grant of two years yeah. with those conditions do i have a seconder 
David. Do you wish to speak? You haven't spoken yet. No, I think we've said enough. <laughs> I was amazed, as I always am, at what comes out of what seems to be a very simple. <laughs> Are there any new points that anyone wants to raise the proposal in front of us, or shall I move to the vote? Okay, you're just, you're just happy with the um, with the assessment, the economical assessments, and everything that's going to be done over that two year period, which is why we're, we're taking this route. Yeah. The assessment is what you talked about was the noise and the impact of vehicle displacement and the public view on the landscape, not the economic benefits. Okay. okay. I'm also going to suggest that. Um, although I'm sure that the applicant is aware that any signage will require um, advertising consent. As we've already stated, the public rights of way needs to be kept open and the access road to the oil well site must not be obstructed. And that was all part of the preamble and the report. So those would go forward as informative notes to the applicant. So they're obviously they're fully aware of them at this point. Okay. So it's proposed, seconded, move to the vote. Those in favour of granting this application with all those conditions? Unanimous. That is granted, thank you. Right, we're going to extend it fractionally. By that clock, back at half past one, please. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. So, um, we have two pending applications left to consider, um, both at the same address. The first one is PFUL 2021-05633, and that's to sever land and erect a detached three-bedroom chalet bungalow with associated vector access and parking at Old Oaks in Verwood and in your agendas that's pages 63 to 82 and Lucy is going to take us through this one and again we have Steve Savage from Highways on hand to deal with any highway concerns. God bless him, sorry, to trees. And Andrew for tree issues, sorry I should have written it back on my list. Thank you. Sorry Andrew. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. You've uh, very kindly introduced that for me very well, so I shall move on. Um, the application has been brought through to committee uh, under the scheme of delegation. This plan shows the context of the site, which is within the Burwood urban area and the surrounding pattern of residential development, including the new housing development that's currently being built and being built uh, on the opposite side of Eastworth Road. Also worth noting is the red line boundary. Uh, which has been altered during the course of the application to be pulled back from the boundary with Edmondson Road to provide a seven metre strip here and a two metre strip from the carriageway on Eastworth Road. Looking at photos here, you can see the application site from the old oaks dwelling in the central part of the site here and the two protected oak trees in the foreground. The closest tree, this one here, would sit just outside the application site boundary, and this tree would be within the application site boundary, um, and this area here would be provided for garden for the new dwelling. Second photo is a view from Eastworth Road with the edge of the existing garage on the right-hand side here, and the neighbouring bungalow beyond. A two metre setback from the edge of the uh, carriage, uh, sorry, from the edge of the road um, of Eastworth Road would be maintained here. This is a view of the site um, looking from the opposite side of um, Edmonton Road towards Eastworth Road, and you can see the new residential development just on the opposite side of the lane here. It's also worth noting that the land would remain free uh, from development on the edge of the carriageway, which had been a concern uh, during the course of the application and the application site was then amended so that this area of land would remain open 
and the undeveloped. Next photo shows the existing Old Oaks dwelling. This front part of the property has recently been approved for change uh, of use from a residential annex to a separate dwelling. Um, however, permission has not yet been implemented. Now come into the rear of the uh, um, of the garden, or sorry, the car parking area for the existing old oaks dwelling, and you can see the garage building, the subject of the conversion and, and change of use and extension to a new dwelling here. And then on the opposite side of Edmondson Road, you can see the existing pattern of development. And here is one of the trees that would um, be within the application site. The block plan shows that the proposal would extend the existing detached garage, introduce an additional wing which would extend forward of the front elevation here. Um, and some of the existing open land to the front of the site would then be um, enclosed with a hedge to the front of a, a, um, a fence going in, and that is subject to condition. Um, during the course of the application, I know I've uh, set out, but that had, has been uh, amended just to ensure that there was sufficient space to enable a sufficient open land to be maintained to the front of the site. It's also mm -hmm. relevant. Um, I'm just going to sort of go through the, the plans very quickly. Obviously, the tree uh, area, the garden that's um, surrounded or, or would be um, affected by the existing trees um, does cover quite a lot of the garden area. However, it is relevant to note, and I think we'll, Tree Officer will expand on this in more detail, but there is an existing or there would be an area of courtyard garden to the rear, which um, has patio doors leading from a sitting area. Um, that would be completely free of the tree cover and they are oak trees so obviously they don't have tree co um, leaf cover for the whole whole of the year. Um, the way that the internal layout has been um, uh, designed is that it's open plan so that there are other windows not just these northern facing windows that, that would light all of this space so there are no rooms that are only served by this northwest, sorry, northeast elevation. This next plan, sorry, just shows how the design of the building would reflect the existing character of the old oaks dwelling and the new dwelling would reflect that character. So it's a chalet style building. And this plan shows a street scene plan which fronts onto Eastwood Road and sits opposite the new residential development on the other side of Eastwood Road. I've included for members' information uh, uh, details of the previously approved scheme. So it's just to show that this garage building has already been approved to be extended upwards and to have dormer windows installed. So that could be implemented, notwithstanding. Um, the scheme before you today. However, the current scheme would then introduce this additional element and it would be a, a separate dwelling. And just floor plans for your for members' interest. At the northeast elevation, this elevation here is the one that faces towards those trees. So in summary, the principle of development is considered acceptable design and impact on character of the surrounding area. Uh, the impact on trees is considered acceptable uh, and the recommendation is to grant permission. There are a number of conditions set out within the um, main agenda report, um, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I understand that the agent wishes to speak on this application. I've got you down as speaking on the next one, but can I clarify, is it one or both? both. The floor is yours. have three minutes. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. My name is Daryl Howells and I'm a chartered town planner and I'm here today speaking on behalf of the applicant and the owner of the property at Old Oaks. 
From the outset of this planning application, your senior planning officer has proactively negotiated and sought amended plans for this scheme. The conclusion of her detailed consideration is the recommendation to approve. As you have heard, the proposed dwelling has been designed to reflect the appearance of the original dwelling at Old Oaks and the recently approved dwelling, which was formerly an annex to the property. Designing the new dwelling to respect the existing architectural characteristics will ensure it positively contributes to the character and appearance of the street scene, which is evolving. No harms and residential amenities will occur due to careful consideration of the relationship to neighbouring properties and the windows. The proposed dwelling will be positioned due west of number 53, so no material loss of light will occur to that property's rear garden or the dwelling itself. The amended site plan has a large garden area that will be partially in shade, but other areas will not. Cumulatively, the size of the garden, garden provided will be adequate to meet the needs of the intended occupiers. In respect of the relationship to mature trees in the rear garden, your agricultural officer supports the planning application. The amended site plan also shows the alignment of the boundary to the rear garden, which has been amended. That alignment is now positioned to Curtilage to be two metres back from Eastworth Road and seven metres back from Edmondson Road to maintain adequate visibility displays and access arrangements for the public. Again, your, your officer supports the application, as does the highway officer. The proposed development com does, com does comply with adopted planning policies and the applicant welcomes the conditions that have been outlined in the officer's report. I therefore ask <coughs> to support the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments that officers want to pick up from what the public speaker has said? No? Okay. First speaker then is Shane Bartlett. Ooh. Oh, sorry. Yes. No, no, no. Thank you for reminding me. I'll get shot. Um, I am one of the local members for this application. However, one of the other local members cannot be here, but sent in a deputation, um, which is to be read out. Yeah. More technology, if you change it, bear with me. I'll be, I'll be honest, I was just, just about to hear my computer crash. So, ah. <laughs> even though, there's one thing I didn't have in a minute. Before, and, but here we are. So, so this is first. for um, five, six B3. Yes, that's correct. Uh, from uh, Councillor Spencer Flower, three board members. My big concern is not so much about the actual building that being proposed, more about the longer term pressure on the two mature oak trees, which will cause significant overshadowing and dominance of the land, which will become the garden. These trees are of significant amenity value and have the benefit of being protected by TPOs. The key concerns would be that although account has been taken for a root protection area, no account has been taken of the shading aspect of the trees and household amenity for the enjoyment of the garden and would thus lead to future pressure for removal. The BS 5837 Heron 2012 suggests that this should be considered as the relationship of buildings to large trees can cause apprehension to occupiers or users of nearby buildings or spaces, resulting in pressure for the number of trees. Buildings and other structures should be cited, allowing adequate space for the trees and natural development, with due consideration given to its predicted height and canopy spread. Mm. Giving permission for this application will almost certainly cause the culling of one or both mature oak trees. Sorry, once the property is occupied due to the significant dominance of the garden area, this must surely be avoided given the important and material amenity value of these mature oak trees, which are a unique feature of the wood. For the, the reasons set out above, I urge the committee to refuse this application. So I'll come back to officers again. You've heard the deputation oh, from one of the local members. Do you have any comments to respond to at this point? 
Yeah. Well, unless um, unless our tree officer wants to just comment on issues relating to the concerns about pressures on the tree from the, the future development, is that something that might yeah. assist members just to hear mm -hmm. a response on that point? Yeah, um, I've been involved as the senior tree officer um, in the design of the house and its context and its just positioning in relation to the oak tree which now stands solely within the site and also obviously in respect of the second oak tree which now stands outside of the red line originally it was inside the red line. The property is being redesigned to take into to, to minimize windows but at the same time allow as much light into the reception rooms as possible which was which was taken into consideration um, also, uh, the foundation design, which is going to, should the application be successful, uh, will not use a strict foundation, but or, nor concrete piles, but rather use a screw auger um, or screw pile to facilitate completely above the field. So, from the point of view of the uh, installation of foundations, there will be no impact on the tree, um, the tree or the tree's roots. Fortunately for the applicant, and in many ways for the tree, um, there is a disused found sewer drain running, and I don't think I've got a drawing with that shown in it. Okay, um, um, it, it, right, okay, so it runs. Um, I haven't got any control of the mouse, I won't have any, will I? No. Would you mind if I do that? No. Would you mind if I just pop no. My apologies. What's that? It's this one. Yeah. There is a, there's a disused foul sewer drain which runs from approximately this point here, straight down the site, to approximately that point there, and is I believe, and Mr. Housen will be able to, um, I'm sure, be able to confirm, is approximately 1.6 metres deep. So it is beyond the depth we would expect the tree roots to be, tree roots to be occupying. So that, that further um, will reduce any risk of root damage to the tree. Um, my, my belief is we won't come, they won't come across any tree roots at all um, because, because of this, this pre-existing disused foul water drain, which is intact. The, the issue, and I think the main concern, um, is the pressure that is perceived will be placed upon the oak trees, but specifically the oak tree within the site as a result of this extension to the garage being built. And I understand from, um, from your perspective why, and Councillor Flower's perspective, why that concern is there. The, the, princip the principle of physically building the building, I think, is a horticulture is completely acceptable with what the building is, very, and as, I, as I've already discussed. My view is that while the amenity area servicing this proposal will be shady. I don't believe that it will put any additional pressure on that tree at all. Um, the tree has is perfectly healthy. Um, there's a little bit of debris in the canopy which, need, which would need to be removed in any case and that doesn't need permission um, via the tree preservation order. That would be exempt works. Uh, it's my understanding that there is no proposed pruning of the tree canopy in order to facilitate the build. Um, and any future occupier of the house 
will have to take into consideration that that oak tree is there and it is going to be something they need to consider when buying the property. I feel, I feel that I could quite happily defend unreasonable tree works should an application by a future occupier be put to prune, reduce or even fell the tree. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that I, that, 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 that I, I have, I have um, uh, the, the ability to, to defend that tree being there. The tree is a really important landscape feature. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Its companion tree, which now sits just outside the site, is also an extremely important landscape feature. Um, to give you a little bit of back history, stop me if you want to. To give you a little bit of back history of my involvement in, in this site, I was involved very much on the penny farthing development across the road, uh, across the East West Road, and also the, the penny farthing development on, on the southern side. We had um, a lot of discussions with highways at that time about the original intention to put a footpath, um, a lot of actually cut into the bank um, adjacent to the oak tree outside on the corner to, to produce a footpath, which we totally were against because of it going into the, into the tree rooting area. I dealt with um, all applications regarding the extensions to the Old Oaks building, which includes the third oak tree, which you can see on that plan to the to the bottom, which I think is being is being pointed out to you. And that has resulted in extensions. It's also resulted in that there's a, 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 a garage straight car park going to be put up. And there's been no detriment to that tree whatsoever. I am quite confident that anybody that would be occupying that property cannot take into consideration that those oak trees aren't there. And if you look, I think one thing that it changes to a degree is, is the current um, environment and the need for shade. Now, if you look at this summer, for all kinds sake, obviously it's been incredibly hot and there's a requirement of shade. So in actual fact, having those trees there for many people would be absolutely beneficial. Some people wouldn't want them, but they wouldn't be looking at the house. Um, I, I think what we need to look at here is, is, is a couple of issues. Is A, can the house be built firstly without any detriment to the retention of the tree as it is? My belief is it can be. Um, modern, build, modern building techniques have moved on so far um, that, that, that the use of a, a screw auger or a screw pile okay, will have absolutely minimal, minimal impact. And the location of the screw piles in relation to any tree roots that are um, encountered can be altered. Um, to, to facilitate that no, no significant tree roots are, 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 um, are damaged. The, 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 the um, location of the disused bough sewer drain is a real benefit to the tree. Um, the orientation of the internal rooms, I um, spoke to the applicant and that um, alteration, alterations have been um, uh, made to reduce the uh, necessity for windows facing into the tree's canopy um, by, uh, by additional, uh, additional uh, windows to service the uh, principal rooms. Um, and I believe that Yes, the gardens will be shady. There will be debris coming from those trees, acorns, leaves, small levels of deadwood. Deadwood will have to be managed, which doesn't require consent over the tree preservation order. So that situation doesn't change whether a property is there or a property is not. Um, and I, I, I'm quite confident that we can uh, that the that the uh, that the development in this case is actually viable. Okay, thank you. So, Shane. Thank you, Chairman. Um, 
and thank you for the officers for the presentation. And particularly for the tree officer, because he's answered all my questions for me before I got a chance to ask him. Mm. <laughs> it's truly really disappointing. Um, so I'm struggling now. <laughs> um, what I would say is that in future reference, we have a tougher application like this, Madam Chairman. It might be beneficial if we have those types of technical drawings of a screw auger or a screw pile, because um, I'm not conversant with construction technology. To that extent, but it would have been interesting just to have seen corkscrew. it. Yeah, I know, but it would have been interesting to have seen it, and within the context of this actual planning application. Um, I suppose really my question, the other question I've got left is, and you've more or less answered it already, is in terms of long term, and you said that you you said that you can fight any um, proposal that may come forward to do either a canopy lift or or uh, any room works on this tree to reduce its size or potentially to fell it completely. Um, is there anything that we can put in conditions that would further strengthen that? Is there a need for that? There's nothing we can, through your own chairman, is there anything we can do? No, the, 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 the trees are covered by, by, by the tree preservation order. Um, the, the tree preservation order, there are certain exemptions. Uh, and those exemptions are, are, are what would be the removal of dead wood. Um, if the tree becomes, if the tree dies or becomes dangerous, then um, certain part, uh, different parts of the town country legislation covered, like where what's known as a section 14 can be served. But it's up to the local authority as to whether or not we accept it as a, as a section 14, which again makes it a tree imminent. If a tree were to become imminently dangerous, there is no reason why that tree's condition will change with that property there or with that property not. The only pressure that that tree will come under is if the occupier makes trees. <laughs> and, 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 and without wanting to sound ridiculous, it is quite obvious, there is absolutely no way that anybody would buy that house if they didn't fully understand the implications of what those two trees give that property. Um, if somebody were to buy that property and then put an application to sell it, their argument would have to be so unbelievably strong um, that I can't, it, it, it just, it, well, there isn't an argument, unless in decades time, which obviously is unforeseeable, <laughs> the tree becomes diseased and therefore becomes dangerous. But that wouldn't be, in my opinion, as a result of the application before then, it would be part of its natural life cycle. Um, I fully appreciate how important these trees are and I um, have worked quite extensively with the applicant who I've worked on a number of applications with and he's a horticultural consultant who is extremely respected. Um, and the, I feel that the, the, the opportunity to develop site is there without harm to the tree, be it immediate or long term. Yeah, we've also put conditions on relating to the foundation design, service routes, uh, and so on, which Andrew had requested, so that was covered during the construction process as well. Uh, I'm going to take the liberty as a local member <clears throat> to ask a question myself, which I don't normally do from the chair. However, um, you've talked um, quite some length about the construction and all of that, and I'm, I'm quite happy with that and the design. It's not an issue. What I, I'm trying to get my head around is the immunity of future residents because the number of times I've had in my inbox, someone's bought property in the winter mm. and in naivety come the summer, didn't realise the size of the canopy when it's in full leaf. And I, my question is how much natural sunlight will be in that garden for the future occupier of that property to enjoy during the summer? Um, Madam Chairman, to give you a specific answer, as in there will be, the garden will be 20% um, sunlight. I'm not asking for a percentage. No, 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 no. 
there will be dappled sunlight within within the garden. There's no doubt about, about that. At certain points, and not obviously during the winter months, the one, if there will be significant sunlight. Um, it will be a shady garden. There is no doubt about that. But, and I think this is the important thing. And I I come across as part of my job in um, overseeing the tree work applications in East Dorset on numerous occasions. We bought this house, as, as you very correctly said, Madam Chairman. Um, we bought this house. I love the kitchen. I love the dining room. I saw it in the winter. I didn't take into consideration the um, impact the trees would have on the garden. Our stock answer, and this has been backed up time and time and time again, that appeal by the inspectorate is the tree was there when you bought the property. It's something you should have looked at and should have taken into consideration. My view on this particular site is that the tree issue is so dominant that you cannot take that into account. Um, it's not a case whereby you have a tree, which is, in my, in my experience, a lot of them, you have a tree which may even be, may even be off site but adjacent or at the bottom of a garden where it isn't taken into consideration and the, 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 the light loss is, it is more than people thought it would want. And again, my experience is that light loss is an issue primarily mid to late afternoon rather than morning. And the reason for that is, is that's when the garden is primarily used, and especially if you're working when you predominantly want to use the garden. But the garden is umbrella. It has a massive sunshade over the, a large part portion of the garden. And that will have to be taken into consideration by whoever purchases the property. It will appeal to a certain type of person. Um, I, I take your point. It will it will be shady. There will be debris. Um, on certain years, there will be very high masts, which means there will be a lot of acorns here. Certain years, there won't be, as is the case now. Um, there will be years where um, the the amount of honeydew, which is um, if you don't know, a lot of people think it's something that the trees give out. It isn't. Honeydew is aphid proof. Okay, so that's very that can be very seasonal and it can be very annual. So some years you won't get any, other years it can be really bad. Um, but again, I think that that is something that any future occupier of this property will be aware of. The trees, but the tree is too prominent. Um, I think that, yeah, um, I, I understand, um, Madam Chairman, that um, you're more comfortable with the, the build techniques and, and the way in which the building is being occupied. Um, I, I'm quite certain that there won't be any. Any, um, any damage to the, the tree at all to sort of build. Um, and I'm, I'm, I am confident that there will be no future pressure placed on the tree by us. And if so, tree preservation will be there. Um, and the tree, we, we will be able to defend it um, should, that, should that be. Okay, thank you. Could I just come in very quickly and also just say thanks ever so much, Andrew. This area here also just to say is nine metre by about two and a half metre area that's um, accessed by French doors from the living room. Um, so that that is somewhere which would be completely unaffected by shade. But yeah, thank you. OK, thank you. David, you indicated to speak earlier. Yes, I can make a comment about <clears throat> about an oak tree because in my back garden, well, my son's back garden, but we reside there as well, uh, with an extension which has a flat roof. There's a 200 year old tree in it. Uh, and yes, you're quite right with the, with the shade. I mean, the back garden is shaded. I think we get the sun uh, in, in the summer 
actually see the sun, let's put it that way, from about five to seven o'clock. Um, the debris is considerable. I mean, two years ago, as you say, every 10 years, I think oak trees sort of chat to each other and decide that they're going to throw their acorns down. And there were thousands of acorns came down, and there's a lot of acorns this year. On the other hand, if you do get a hot summer, which we do, apparently, or we're going to do, it's wonderful because you're in the shade. Um, <clears throat> the other thing you've got to bear in mind, of course, is, is what plants you can actually grow in your garden with the actual uh, shade, because oak trees, as you know, take a lot of uh, water, uh, and so uh, gardens soon dry out. I did take the opportunity, uh, strangely enough, to actually walk round uh, Eastwood Road uh, and Edmundsham Road, because I only live round the corner from it. Uh, the two oak trees are magnificent. Uh, I was looking at them and trying to work out how someone was going to get in and around this, this oak tree, because they are magnificent. Uh, and I think what you say is quite to us to be borne in mind. So as a resident with a very large oak tree, um, why my son chose to buy the house with a massive oak tree in, I think he bought it in the winter, uh, and he's blessed it ever since. We did have one in the front, actually, it was only 180 years old, which was an acorn from the one at the back, I would suggest. Fortunately, or sadly, uh, as we have the tree officer here, it was showing declines of dying. Uh, so we did get permission to remove that one. But uh, yeah, you've got to be very careful. It is a good point that you've, uh, that you've made. Uh, so I did a sort of site visit, as it were, but it was a quick site visit because, believe it or not, it started to rain. And I then realised just how long Eastwood Road is. <laughs> not as... When you look at it from the main road, it looks short. But I didn't realise that halfway down, you've got the stanchions and you're only halfway down and it was rained harder. So I had to do a quicker walk down to the main road. But uh, it was very interesting actually walking around. It's not often I walk around Burwood, um, <clears throat> but, uh, but that was one occasion I did. So it was a kind of site visit. So I can see where the building is and where the development is. Mm. Thank you, Alex. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> yes, we seem to be, well, I'm always obsessed with trees, but the, to me, the big blind spot that we're forgetting about is that in fact, people are poisoning trees in Dorset quite often. And the one, you know, ex one exemption from a TPO is if the tree is dying or dead. Now, I'm not saying that the first person who buys the house <coughs> obviously is going to be aware of the tree, but most people buy the house and then they want to shape the surrounding to suit their life. So I still think that that tree is going to, is quite likely become a victim of okay. malfeasance, possibly in future. Um, it is a possibility we should consider. So I think we can't say that TPO sorts everything. I just wonder whether, you know, we ought to be building houses right next to trees. I know. <laughs> it is not impossible, right? Intent is not a material planning consideration. I'm sure it isn't at the moment. But perhaps it should be in future. <coughs> okay, Shane, you wanted to come back. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, I think um, we've obviously have been, had a um, the professional viewpoint from the tree officer, which has given me a lot of assurance mm -hmm. over this application. Um, we can't surmise or guess what's going to happen in the future. Um, and it is up to the individual should this house be built for an individual who wants to buy it. That's that's becomes their issue and their problem then. And I think, um, I think on balance, Madam Chairman, I'm happy to propose um, to go with the officer recommendation and the conditions as laid out within the report. Okay. I have a second. <clears throat> Does anyone else wish to speak on this? I shall be voting on this one. 
All those in favour, please. Six. Those against? Yeah. Therefore, the application is granted as per the officer recommendation. Okay, I should move on to agenda item nine, which is the second application for this site. PFUL 2021-05535, change of use of verge to form part of residential curtilage, erect detached carport and vehicular access between carport and adopted highway at Old Oaks Verwood. And that's on pages 83 to 98 on your agenda. Thank you, Captain. Thank you, Chair. Just gotta wait for my to pull up. Um, apologies for the delay. I've just gotta wait for the other application to load. Thank you. So the application report starts on page 83 of your agenda and is for the change of use of the verge to form part of the residential garden, the erection of a detached carport and vehicular access between the carport and the adopted highway. Mm -hmm. The application has been through the scheme of delegation and I would refer members to page 67 of the main agenda report in which further comments have been received from Councillor Flower confirming that the concern is not so much about the, um, sorry this is for the other application, con confirming that their um, objection has actually been uh, withdrawn. There is a, uh, an objection from the parish council, which uh, remains. And I would just uh, sort of reiterate the objection was in relation to the um, highway land uh, and issues associated with that. But the application has been amended, which I'll show you again on this. This slide, sorry. So, yeah, as with the previous application, uh, which included the 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 um, reduction in size of the application site. This application follows that, but also includes the wider land associated with Old Oaks, uh, the existing dwelling there, and includes the provision of a, a carport in this location here. So the two applications are completely separate. This one um, would, would still involve um, the land, sorry, does not result in a new dwelling. It is purely for additional garden land and carport in association with the old oaks dwelling. This photo is taken from Edmonton Road again. I appreciate you've seen it on the previous uh, application, but just to, to reiterate to members, in the foreground is the mature oak tree that's just outside the application site, and the second tree uh, is just within the application site. <coughs> Views up Eastworth Road, again showing um, the Old Oaks dwelling, the um, boundary of the garden area would be in this location here, and also the rear garden area, there would be a carport position in roughly that location there. Again, a photo through showing the existing uh, and newly constructed resident uh, penny farthing development on the opposite side of the road, and you can just see the edge of the garage building here. Looking over the neighbouring property, 53 Edmonton Road, the carport here and this garden, um, sorry, this area of land, which is proposed to be uh, enclosed into garden land. You can now see the front of the annex building and existing Old Oaks building and the new carport would be in that location here. Again, you can see the oak, third oak tree, which Andrew referred to on the previous application. Uh, which would not, well, it could be successfully accommodated without detriment to that protected tree. And just a further photo of the annex. This photo, so you can see this is the um, existing building and annex. This is the garage building as permitted, but not constructed. So it's got the, this was a, a further permission following on from the originally uh, built garage as is on site now. This is the carport that's proposed as part of this planning application. And again, you can see the, the boundary. So there's a two meter setback from the highway on this end. And this part of the garden here, there is a one meter setback from the highway. Just a further plan, 
Um, initially, there were some highway concerns uh, from the Highways Authority in relation to uh, the construction method of this access. Um, further, uh, a condition has been set out and uh, agreed by the Highways Authority that um, subject to condition, this access would be appropriate and there was no objection to the siting of the carport. These are the elevations showing how they sort of reflect the character of the um, existing building with timber. And in summary, the development is considered acceptable, subject to various planning conditions that are set out within the main agenda report. And the recommendation is to grant planning permission subject to those conditions. Any further, Tanya? Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. And the agent wishes to speak on this one as well. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, members again. Um, according to your senior planning officer's detailed consideration of the application, the principle is acceptable. The scale, design, impact to the character and appearance of the area is also acceptable. So is the impact to the immunity, impact to the trees, and finally, the parking arrangement is equally all acceptable. Clearly, this scheme complies with adopted planning policies in accordance with your officer's recommendation. The applicant owns the verge, and in, in part, this application seeks to regularise to incorporate it as part of his residential curtilage in order to control access across private land. As you have heard, the planning application still retains the seven and a two metre se separation back from Eastworth Road and Edmonton Road to maintain the visibility displays, public access and open character. And as a result, the proposal is supported by your highway officer. The proposed carport will be absorbed by the street sea without any material harm to visual amenities, as its design has been uh, has, sorry, as its design has been um, okay, sorry, change of thought, as its design has been uh, proposed to be subservient to the existing housing. I would ask your officer's recommendation to be endorsed, please. Thank you. Thank you. Do officers wish to respond to any of the points made by the agent? If I may, Chair, just to um, clarify, the applicant may well have the freehold control of the land, but it has highway rights over it, which is um, why you've seen on both plans that large swathe of green, which shows the seven metre setback, two metre strip running along the eastern side of East Earth Road and then narrowing down to a metre. So highway rights exist over all of that land, and should the applicant be successful in gaining his planning approval, would obviously need to extinguish those rights, which is obviously something done outside of the planning system. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. As you're aware, um, Councillor Flowers did write in, but has also um, withdrawn his objection. However, I understand because of the reference to from the Town Council in their objection, um, we feel it's important to read out what Councillor wrote in. On Councillor Spencer's power, my original objection was the loss of the safe route to store. However, having recently visited the location, I noted that a formal footpath has now been installed on the other side of the road as a resort of the nearby penny farthing housing development. Whilst not condoning the erection of the fence to the current position like permission, I may contend that the adjacent footpath adequately deals with my concerns regarding safe route to school, so I formally withdraw my objections to this application. David. Um, touched on by uh, Mr. Savage. Um, what about highway rights and, and they will be extinguished? Just so the, people have walked on this land, I assume, for quite a long time. Is that so that there would be a public right of way established if it, or could be? established if if people have walked yeah. regularly over this verge for, for for several years but so is it would that right of way when you talk about highway rights are you talking about a public right of way or is that something separate and then a second question would be are they proposing fencing along the boundary um adjacent to the highway 
Um, and does that fencing need planning permission if it's over 1.4 metres? Through you, Chair, I can ask the first question. The, there are highway rights across the freehold land which um, allow for the right of passage for um, all road users, I think it's a technical term. Um, I don't think it establishes it as a right of way. Um, so, uh, as I say, the applicant has the freehold control of the land. We have highway rights over them. He is in the process of applying to us through the Highways Act to extinguish um, those highway rights. As a highway authority, we're accepting of that. Um, but yes, uh, technically, uh, the right of passage would involve uh, all members of the public being able to walk across the existing land until such time as that right is extinguished. If I've got anything wrong there, I'll have to defer to my um, legal colleague to, uh, <laughs> to tell me off. <laughs> so, so we've got the yeah. fence, the, in relation to the fence and for what we actually got when we when the application was amended to get it away from the uh, carriageway was to have a native hedge planted on the side, the public view side, and then there would be a fence behind. But details of that are set out they would have to um, discharge condition four, which requires landscaping scheme, details of garden enclosure, including a planting scheme showing the mix of native species um, and that that has to be fully implemented. So the public view would be of a, a native hedge. Okay. So there'd be stretch of verge, which yeah. would have had highway rights, but will no longer, that is extinguished. There's a hedge and a fence. So once those highway rights are extinguished, people can't walk across along that verge on that side of the road. There's no public right of way that is, or could somebody come forward and say, I've walked this land for the last 30 years, I want a right of way. So I'm just going to get the right slider. Do you want to do it? Um, yeah. I think you I need to jump deal, in on this one. Deal with that in fairly short order. Um, yeah. Because it's already fine. And anyone using that would be using it by right, so they would not be able to then come forward and claim no, uh, a new right of way to respond right. because by right. Yeah. Just going to, sorry, just to okay. help a little bit. And um, so this, this plan, the, the garden would be enclosed here, so there would be no enclosure on this land here. So the, the hedge would be where my strange cursor is going here. <laughs> Does that make more sense? I might share the, the green area you can see, Councillor, on the plan is retained as highway yeah. road. The, the strip, the continuation of the thin sliver you can see, the one metre strip will then be continuing its way down Eastworth Road. It's also notable, so, um, uh, there are some quite nice, there's quite nice street furniture already there that would all be retained as part of this development. Can I just clarify, sorry, the strip of verge where the carport's going, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. south of that colour block plan, yeah. is the existing things being retained in that position or is that being moved to accommodate this application? The application shows that the um, the boundary is set at one metre from the highway. If that fence is not in the correct position, then it is not a fence that has the benefit of this planning permission. Okay. And is, if it's being set back a metre, does that mean the hedgerow is being planted in that metre? So in, in the fullness of time, that full metre will be infill with hedgerow so there'll be no um, gap between the edge of the carriageway and the hedgerow. I would have to say the the element that would have the hedge and fencing is this area here. The area to the rear is not proposed to have hedging. I thought this we were talking about the other application. We are the, the whole yeah but the, the whole of this site is included so if we go okay. yeah. Thank you sorry. David. The, on the map that you're showing, thank Sorry, you. This is, might be confusing because this is the other application, but it had the green yeah, no, no, plan. No, Sorry. That's fine. I, I get that. Um, you've got a nice fat strip of green 
to the north and it bends around and gets narrower and you've got a strip of very narrow green that's that's the one meter width one is it yeah. then you've got the carport which is brown yeah. and then to the south of the carport there's there's a what reading a map would look to be some sort of footpath or something what is that there's a double line through you chair the, the brown area you can see that's the carport. It yeah. isn't going to be brown. That's still going to be retained as our highway land. Okay, that will be the access crossing, as it were, which will be subject to okay. 184 license for construction. The area below it, the thin strip, will be an extension of that grassed area. It isn't a footway. It's an extension of the grassed area, which will be retained as highway verge, because there is a footway on the other side of Eastworth Road now. Okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, Yes, it does. I'm, I'm just really thinking about walking around this and uh, we've got a footpath on the other side of the road. If you're walking around, it's probably easy to stick to the grass bit and, and walk down Eastworth Road on the grass. The, um, as Councillor Flower alluded to in his comments, um, when the Penny Farthing development was uh, built to the north of the site, we required them to provide a footway extension link on the northern side of Edmonton Road, which extends further across to the west of the junction that you can just about see on that plan, providing a safe crossing point to the south, which then links up to the new footway, which is running along the western side of Eastworth Road. So there should be no requirement for anybody to walk on that nice bit of grass or indeed past the applicant's house. But obviously we need to re retain some element of highway verge to maintain a protective area so if people are driving down they're not wiping their wing mirrors out on people's fences or right on the highway boundary okay okay thank you Madam chairman uh to look at the, the the plan that we've got in front of us the the currently just the area in the blue line um as I understand it, the bridge has been moved back to the red line. So on the junction for Eastworth Road and is it Edmundsham Road, is it? Yep. Yep. Um, as I understand it, Mr. Savage, through you, Madam Chairman, does that, that give us better sight lines on that junction? Is that one of the benefits of this application, is it? The site, through you, Chair, the sight lines will remain as existing. We have checked the sight lines. They do accord with 30 mile per hour speeds. I think it's fair to say that some um, poor drivers exceed the speed limit there. But we're maintaining what's already there at the junction councillor. So we're, make, we're ensuring that it is no worse than existing. And if everybody drove around at the speed limit, then it'd be fantastic. Thank you. Come back. And then Alex. No, I defer to um, Councillor Brenton. Can I just have clarity that um i don't know if you've got a photograph of, of sort of of this corner um this i'm concerned that the, the green area and possibly the fence is going to sort of be right up against the, it will be i assume then right up against the trunk of the tree the outer tree that wasn't in the last application but is in this one so is the tree going to be inside the property or outside the property will people be able to walk underneath that tree so t1 i think and andrew tell me if i'm wrong t1 is just outside the application at the moment or will be it will be it will be, it will be. the trunk will be just outside so the fence t2 or hedge will, will be behind yes in just behind that bit you'll obviously see it as you come around this bit here and then the hedge would be visible along this so the hedge, the hedge is going between the two trees. Yes. yes. Okay. But the public will still be able to walk up underneath the branches of the outer tree, if we call it an outer tree or a T1. So will the will the hedge be visible? No, not the hedge. No. The, the the public amenity of being able to walk under a shady tree on a hot day. Will that still be? You know, will you be able to walk up to that tree? There would be no physical thing stopping you from going up to T1. OK, so one can sit under there on a hot day. Yeah. The tree, the first tree that you see in the photograph, yep. the tree's main stem, its trunk, will remain on highway land. 
outside of the application site that we discussed previously. So it will be short, if I may, Madam Chair, and forgive me. If you and I, um, if you want to touch <coughs> the tree's trunk, <coughs> you will be able to do so. <laughs> <laughs> without, without, or, or even hug it. And as you know, we all do it on occasion. Um, not often. Um, you, yes, you will still be able to do that. Will that tree then become, will it remain in private property? Will it become part of the highway's responsibility? It's not actually on highways land, though it has highways rights. Yeah, my understanding okay, is that the first tree that you're seeing in that photograph yeah. will remain the property and therefore the maintenance of the applicant, Mr. De Kock. Highways that retain their rights over that land but they don't have maintenance responsibility for that land it will be the applicant who will retain that land um as he does at the moment jane thank you chairman we've got ourselves quite preoccupied with trees on this one haven't we yeah um so going back to the to the garage <laughs> Yeah. Um, was <laughs> as part of the proposal um taking into account madam chairman that the the adjustment in the roof height i think sits within the street setting it doesn't bring any detrimental harm to the to that street setting um and taking everything into account the officers said concerning the verge and that there is no really material plan of considerations to oppose the proposal in front of us with the conditions that are attached and i'm happy to recommend that we grant subject to the officer's report, Madam Chairman. Do I have a second day? Might die. Does anyone else wish to speak on this application? Right. David. Just on the uh, on this picture that's in front of us on, on the slide, the patch of grass that we're seeing with the telegraph pole and the, the road sign and the street naming. Are those things on private land? That is that is the extent of highway, current extent of highway. So it's all on highway land. And those elements will remain on highway land. Mr. Cock owns the freehold of that land, but there are highway rights across it. That probably doesn't make any clearer what I've said, does it? But well, no, it, it just... <laughs> the, 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 Thinking about many years, there's things called way leaves and easements that I've forgotten all about now um, that let you put things on private land. So electricity boards do it with pylons and post office do it with telegraph poles. So is, is there something, is there a legal obligation on the owner of the land to allow these things to remain in place? Yes, I mean, if we've got highway rights across it, then it's the responsibility for the highway authority to license any furniture, works, etc. upon it. Okay. Right, so these things can stay, there's no problem with them. Right, Anyone you. else wish to speak on this application? In that case, it has been recommended for grant as per the officer recommendation and duly seconded. Those in favour, please. Make that six. And those against? Oops. One. Thank you. That is granted. So going back to the agenda, we have um, front page. Do apologise. <laughs> Items 10, which is urgent items, there are none. And 11 exempt items, again, there are none. At half past two and a bit, 2.34, we've come to the end. Thank you for your time and, and forbearance with all the issues this morning. I'll call the meeting over.
Thank you. Thank you.